today. So here we go in just one moment. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you that are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Before I introduce today's guest, Dr. Peter Rogers, because it's the second Sunday of the month, and this is time for Nutrition Insights with Peter Rogers, MD, I have a special guest. So Ben, the husband of my special guest, wrote me and said, could you please make a video wishing my wife happy birthday today? And I love to do that kind of thing. But when I make a video, it's just, it's so hard talking to nobody. I said, Ben, I'll do you one better. Just tell her to be on Zoom. Don't tell her why. And we'll put her on the show and have everybody wish her happy birthday. So please welcome Heather. It's so nice to meet you. Happy birthday. Thank you. It's an honor to meet you, AJ. So who's the cute guy? Well, both of them are cute, but I mean, the <laughs> cute. Well, both of them this are actually- my Actually, yeah. both of them are furry. Uh, both of your cute. Right, yeah, uh, the true one. This is Lucy. Oh, is she is she a cocker spaniel or? She's a miniature dachshund. Oh, she's, she's beautiful. A, yeah, she's she is a sweetheart. So <laughs> it's my anniversary, and it's your birthday. So tell me, why did you want to meet me? I always am so shocked that people like because I don't think of myself <sighs> as very much a big deal, but when people do, I'm like. I'm just me, you know, I'm not. Well, gosh, honestly, okay. Yes. You, your programs, um, have shaped my life and how we eat and has, I think saved our health. Um, we, and it's actually a year anniversary for me. You had your, uh, lose weight with the full plate. Um, I, I think a little over a year ago, it started and that got us back on track because through COVID we became junk food vegans and gained a lot of weight, did not feel good. Um, and that, that offer really got us back on track. So, so happy to hear that. What, so how long have you been following a plant-based diet? When did you first hear of it? Oh, uh, it has been a little over five years. Um, and it started at work. We got an email uh, about fork overnight program and starting meatless Mondays. And we jumped in with both feet. Um, and then shortly after that, um, I found your YouTube channel and you showed me how easy it is to eat this way daily and, and keeping it simple and delicious. And, um, it, that really, you know, formed how we eat on a daily basis. So I will be forever thankful. Well, that's great. Where do you live? We live in Wisconsin. Uh, we are in Appleton. Ah, the cheese capital of the world. Exactly. <laughs> Just the hardest thing for people usually on a plant-based diet to give up. Well, that's great. Your husband joined you in your journey. I love when husbands yes. Smart man. Yes, we, we, we didn't know that. I didn't know that the meatless Monday would have been meatless forever. Monday, but <laughs> that's how it turned out and it worked out well. <laughs> yeah, that's how we started. So any special plans for your birthday? Uh, we'll be visiting family since it's Easter. Uh, but Ben actually planned the entire weekend. We've had a great weekend. So it's it's just been a, a great celebration. Well, thank you. Hey, you know, as long I mean, hey, as long as you got Dr. Rogers here, is there anything you want to ask him? Oh. <laughs> that, on the spot there's so many questions but i it's so hard to pick one thing <laughs> but i mean he's like considered one of the smartest guys in the world in the in the plant-based space too so uh you know this is like a rare opportunity last time i did one of these <laughs> birthday things it was dr lyle and the lady was oh yes i have so many questions oh gosh right and you know i guess i really have um when it comes to medications, I guess that's the hard thing. I know I, I should, you know, and, and this is more for like heart palpitation type of, um, like medications. I know plant-based diets. I was surprised to start having a problem with, with, uh, heart palpitations. And, um, I guess I don't know if there's anything that is suggested to concentrate on food wise that would help help with that. I guess it's one issue that I've had that came up that uh, it's kind of stumped me. Dr. Rogers, what do you know about heart palpitations? Well, my concern would be you could be potentially trending into atrial fibrillation. And a lot of times the reason for heart arrhythmias is because of lack of blood flow to the heart muscle. So I would recommend optimizing your diet and lifestyle as perfect as you can get it to minimize cardiac ischemia, lack of blood flow, and that'll help to maintain normal conduction patterns in your heart. Plus you can look up a chart of all the things associated with 
atrial fibrillation, and that's going to include things like caffeine and alcohol. And I would recommend that you avoid all of those things because you really want to try to prevent atrial fibrillation before it progresses. The more cardiac muscle that becomes ischemic and potentially non-functional, the more likely it's going to become irreversible. So you're sort of catching it early, it sounds like. And by uh, getting all that stuff optimized, you can maintain optimal blood flow to cardiac muscle. I've given lectures on that before as well, how to optimize blood flow. And that'll hopefully uh, prevent it from progressing. And you can, you know, check with your internal medicine doctor, your cardiologist, but whenever possible, it's best to prevent things um, rather than, you know, treat them when they're more advanced. Right. Okay. Thank you. See, wasn't that a great yeah. birthday present? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so don't consult with Dr. Rogers, but thank you so much. And thank you, Ben, for contacting me. And you have a very happy birthday and many more. Thank you, Chef AJ. Take care. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heather. And Dr. Rogers, that was so kind of you. And we're so excited that you're here today. And you're going to be talking about a subject that we've talked about a little bit before on the show with Dr. Nathan Briner, because uh, fluoride. We got we to gotta mute you a little bit there. There we go. Um, so we know that there are some risks, but it's still everywhere. Like you go to the store and it's in almost every toothpaste. Yes, I, I I had the problem. Oh, I forgot to brush my teeth this morning, but I'm joking because I was teased about my teeth, you know, being a little uh, discolored more than they should be. And it's because of the blueberries, just like they'll stain the sink. They also stain the teeth. And they said, oh, you look like you're from England. Your teeth are so bad. No, my teeth are fine. I just got to brush them. I don't usually brush them because I don't want like all the stuff in toothpaste. I usually just use those little interdental brushes and I floss. I don't need any sweets or any soda pop, anything acidic. Um, so because of that, though, because I got teased about my teeth, I go, oh, I got to try to make my teeth whiter. I went to the grocery store and I couldn't believe it. 99% of them all said fluoride, anti-cavity toothpaste. And I'm like, come on, my gosh, that made me almost sad because, you know, I've known over 25 years, fluoride has a lot of serious toxicology problems and the public is completely not aware of it. Well, almost completely. So I had read about it extensively in the past and I just sort of went over my notes again. And it's, yeah, there's a lot of problems with it and kind of interesting. Great. Well, I can't wait to hear your presentation on toxicology in general. I know this is part one. So whenever you're ready, uh, you can share your screen. And if you have time at the end, there's also some questions that people sent in in advance. Okay. Sounds good. All right. I just shared the screen. Can you see it? Not yet. Might have to bring the sun back. <laughs> oh, we got, yeah, we got it. We got to get back into share. How do we get out of this thing? Hey buddy, how do we get out of this thing here? Escape. Escape. All right, and so I gotta go now. Go into Zoom, and I go to share screen, desktop. desktop. Click share. All right, can you see it now? I sure can. Perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so this is basically the outline for the talk. I'm gonna start out talking a little bit about uh, calcium. Then I'm going to talk about fluoride. Then I'm going to talk about sodium. And sort of the goal of the lecture is to, you know, show them some stuff about these ions that is not well known. So that's part of the title of the talk here. It's toxicology part one, and these are ions. Um, and fluoride is also a toxin. Okay, and this is to help people. My goal is to try to be the best you know, I can be as a physician. The rationale for all this is that in order for people to navigate the world effectively and get good results, they have to know what they're dealing with. And it's not well known. <laughs> what's really happening with calcium fluoride and sodium. So I'm going to try to go through that. And the pitfall is, you know, whenever you really tell the truth about stuff that's not well known, sometimes people don't like that, but it is what it is. As Plato said here, why bother? Because you need to know this stuff to be healthy. Okay. So the first slide here is a painting. I like this. It's called playing chess with death. And in a sense, we all do that, trying to stay healthy and live longer. And Ingmar Berman made an interesting movie called The Seven Seal. And here's a knight playing chess with death. Okay. And then I show this in terms of like, what's a good attitude. And what I'm trying to say is medicine tries to think everything is science, science, science. That is not correct. There's a tremendous importance for love and for a hundred percent commitment to something. And I just, I showed this previously in my talk about cancer, how my mom, when she had advanced cancer, advanced, you know, colon cancer, metastatic to her lungs, she's coughing up blood. She had to, one of her grandchildren was in the intensive care unit, born in septic shock. 
And she moved into that ICU for two and a half weeks and stayed with that baby on the ventilator and the baby recovered. And what I'm saying is the doctors did a great job with all the high tech ECMO, endocorporeal membranous oxygenation, heart lung bypass. But what really saved that baby too was my mom was there. I'm with you. I love you. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Holding the baby's hand nonstop with him. And, and that made the baby feel loved. It made him feel safe. So that lowered his stress levels and that enabled his body to heal despite his tremendous sickness. The kid's fine. The kid graduated college. He's fine. Okay. So what I'm trying to say is optimal results in healthcare, science alone doesn't work. That's an important point because people say, oh, I just want science. Well, what I've seen happen is you say all you care about is science and nothing else. It typically gets controlled by somebody who wants to make money and it often doesn't do much good. Love alone is good and it does help, but you also need the knowledge, you know, love plus knowledge and the commitment that becomes very powerful. Then you get the best results, far better than you get with science, so-called science alone or so-called love alone. So that's why we're going to kind of go through this. And then also I'm making the point here is, you know, I saw the need as I went through these old textbooks and they're all out of date and wrong um, that, you know, there was a need for this type of information and lectures on the internet. And I like this quote of Thucydides. This, this painting, by the way, is Pericles funeral oration uh, by Phil Foltz over here. It's uh, beautiful. There's the Acropolis up there, the city on a hill. And Thucydides said when he wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, he said, my history has been composed to be an everlasting possession, not the showpiece of an hour. This book is written not for the applause of the moment, but as a gift to mankind for all time. Okay, Aristotle, the highest activity of man is the pursuit of truth. Okay, we talked about how a lot of people have chronic disease and they get into what I would call health hell, and it's very hard for them to ever get out of it. And the reason they can't get out of it is because they're trying to treat a dietary disease or a toxicology disease with a pill or a surgery, and you're not going to cure a dietary disease with a pill or a surgery. So here's a painting of uh, Sharon um, carrying with a ferry boat the souls over to across the river sticks into hell. And so the point of this lecture too is to get in the boat and head in the opposite direction. That's what we're going to try to do here. This painting is called Crossing the Ford, rather beautiful there. Okay, and so what it basically comes down to as a person gets older, they, they have less bodily physiologic reserve to heal themselves. And they really need to get their health act together the sooner the better, because if they don't start doing it by 35 or around there, they start deteriorating with more and more hypertension, atherosclerosis. And then the conventional medical system typically tries to treat this with drugs, you know, statins, aspirin, all this other stuff. And then <clears throat> that progressively fails. And then they end up going for all these surgeries. They end up losing a tremendous amounts of money and dying prematurely versus if they can get their act together and prevent these dietary diseases and lifestyle related diseases, they can often live much longer, healthier and happier. And you, a lot of people say, oh, everything in moderation. But the problem with that is you're going to be exposed to some toxins and things that are bad for your health, no matter what you do. So you might as well optimize everything that you can control, and then you get the best results. Okay. And I'm also going to say this idea of needing to respect and love the individual as a person is very important in health, because if you don't have it, you don't get the best results. Okay. And I'm, I'll, I'll make sense of this on the next page. Why am I saying this? Okay. And this next thing will show it right here. What typically happens is all these patients with their chronic diseases, they're sad, they're lost, and they just progressively deteriorate because they keep on trying to treat dietary and toxicological diseases with pills and surgery. That does not work. What is the cure rate with conventional medicine for hypertension, for type 2 diabetes, for coronary artery disease? These are the most common causes of death, okay? They're dietary diseases. The treatment rate with pills and surgery is like essentially zero, okay? Okay. You have to take that pill the rest of your life. You're not cured, okay? So with the so-called science, the cure rate is zero, okay? If you had a sports team that lost 100% of the games, they lost every single game, would you say that team is good? No, you would say they don't ever win, okay? When you read the vegan literature, low-fat vegan literature, you routinely hear about hypertension being cured. Captain Pritik and McDougal, Richard Moore, they'll tell you at least about 90%. The longer they have it, the more likely that they're going to have irreversible hypertrophy of the arteries, but... You can still often cure a large number of those patients. And early on, you can cure the vast majority of the patients. Similar things with diabetes, type 2. Okay, If you catch it before they've lost their pancreatic function, tremendous cure rate. Esselstyn, 198 out of 198 patients. The only one who failed, this is a July 2014 article of family practice, was the patient didn't follow the diet. Okay, And it's also a sign to respect and love for the individual. You tell them the truth. It is true. Most people are not motivated 
they're not curious enough to learn or they're lazy, so they're not going to follow the diet. But that's that's okay. That's their individual choice. That's a lot different than not them knowing about it and having a chance. And then the question is, why do I say this? I've been a doctor 30 years or more than 30 years. Gosh, it's been a long time. Okay, so the reason I say this is because here is the fundamental temptation of medicine. Let's say you get a fat 55-year-old guy walks into your office. You can pretty much guarantee he's obese, hypertensive, pre-diabetic or diabetic, high cholesterol, high triglycerides, partial or complete impotence. And if you put him on a bunch of pills, you make money from him every day, send him for cardiology consult. He's going to have some coronary artery disease. Good chance he's going to go for a stent or a cabbage. Stent's going to bill about $30,000. A cabbage means coronary artery bypass graft. So that's open heart surgery where you, you bypass the arteries. Well, that's going to bill for in the ballpark of $120,000. So on the other hand, if you teach him the vegan diet, he might cure himself of all these problems. And that's not very profitable. Okay, that can be taught to him in a couple of days. So what I'm trying to say is look at that temptation, either make $120,000 or only make a small amount of money, whatever it might be. Okay, let's just say 2000 for the sake of discussion. So you have to really, really want the best for that person in order to tell them to go low fat vegan when it's potentially going to mean you're going to lose about $118,000. Okay, that's a lot of money. And that's why I say you can't do it alone with just science, 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 because science is going to be pushed in the direction of money, money, money. Uh, ask anybody. They see that every day. And then the person also has to take responsibility. And a lot of people don't want to. I've had lots of people uh, tell me, oh, I could never do that, become a vegan, et cetera. So they have to want to learn. They have to be curious. Um, they have to watch out for the pitfall. Most of what people think is science is just advertising. Um, and then there's a lot of times peer pressure. When big money talks, the truth shuts up. Big money is able to get its opinion out there in strong ways. Okay. So just being aware of that. And also what I wanted to say was, you know, I had mentioned, and I was le leaning to mention on the previous page in the 1800s, the Catholics, for example, felt they were not treated very well by the Protestants and they started their own school system. And what I'm saying is in health and medicine, something similar is happening now in the internet with the vegan community. Chef AJ with her YouTube channel has basically created like the school of Athens, where you can get a whole bunch of different opinions from persons of different uh, backgrounds and expertise. And so for the viewer, they can really learn all about this stuff that helps them to be healthy. You're not going to find this in a medical textbook. This stuff's not in the medical textbook. You're not going to find this at most of these so-called foundation, the foundation of this disease or foundation of that disease. They're not going to have this information. So it's a wonderful opportunity to be able to go to Chef AJ's site and see all these different experts. So she has really, you know, given a gift to mankind that all this information can become available to the audience, you know, for free. That's a fantastic opportunity. Okay, the next thing I'll talk about is patterns of disease. You know, you hear, you open up a textbook of pathology or disease and you'll see like, you know, 500 diseases or more. And you go, gee, there's so many diseases. How could I learn all this stuff? This is overwhelming. You know, not really. And here's why. There's really mostly patterns of disease. And by patterns of disease, first of all, a high fat, high sodium diet, it's going to cause thick blood, a lot of clotting. It's going to cause a lot of atherosclerosis and basically blocks blood vessels all over the body. I call this TBI, that can be uh, <clears throat> traumatic brain injury, but in our context, it's going to mean total body ischemia. And Pritikin wrote a lot about this as well. And so when you treat this, you treat a whole bunch of problems. A lot of people, when they're old, they're going deaf, they're going blind. It's because the arteries are plugged up in their ears and their eyes and other locations, their spine, et cetera. Okay, lack of fiber. Lack of fiber causes the whole group of abdominal pressure syndrome diseases. I talked about that in the, the most recent lecture on autoimmune disease. Lack of fibers associated with inability to maintain the gut lining intact, the tight junctions. So you get leaky gut and that's the autoimmune diseases. So what I'm saying is we can really narrow down these categories of diseases and usually the treatment for most of them is pretty similar. So it simplifies understanding what you need to do. Um, estrogenic chemicals are ubiquitous in the environment. Um, I talked in previous lectures about how to avoid those. Um, infections can be a problem, but if you optimize all your health in general, your immune system will be much better at preventing infections. Cancer is obviously a very important topic. We've had a couple of lectures on that. And I think the key thing is understanding the metabolic theory. That's where you'll find the most um, understanding of what you can do to help yourself. Okay. The next thing is mental health disorders. And this is a really interesting topic. There's this guy here from Harvard, and I like the guy. He's, you know, his name is Chris Palmer, and he's promoting his new theory, the brain energy theory. And what he's saying is that 
He thinks almost all of the mental health disorders are primarily due to a lack of energy production or dysfunction of the mitochondria in the brain. And I think he's on to something with this mitochondrial dysfunction. I don't agree with his recommendations in the sense that he's a big recommender of the ketogenic diet. And we don't have time to go into all that. We're not going to go into all that. But what I think is happening is that you basically have a certain amount of resilience. You have a certain amount of resilience that enables you, your immune system to prevent infections, that enables you to deal with psychological unpleasant things. And the healthier your brain mitochondria are, the more likely uh, a, a setback in your life, a disappointment will not tip you over the edge into depression or some other type of psychiatric illness. So I basically think having good metabolic health makes you more resilient. And that's how I would phrase it. So we won't go into that anymore, but it's an interesting topic because the, one of the key points he makes is there's a tremendous overlap between obesity, metabolic syndrome, all the mental health disorders, as well as substance abuse, alcoholism, et cetera. And so I think he's on to something. I think he's a bright guy. I think he, he, he's doing his best. I disagree with his uh, reading of metabolism. We won't get into that today. It's a topic for another day, but I've read a lot more about brain pathophysiology and blood-brain barrier than he has. Okay, next topic is toxicology diseases. Um, these are things, there's a lot of them in food, aspartame, MSG, MFG, caffeine, I consider a toxin. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the big F minus here, um, all these other things, okay? And what I meant by you can't completely avoid these things is they're in your environment. There's tons of pollution in the air from the car exhaust, the truck exhaust, the factories, from the planes, uh, in the water, from the F minus. They put aluminum in water as a clarifier. Um, in food, you want to just avoid these processed foods. There's tons of harmful chemicals in there. And then there's these other issues with regard to these other problems here. So you can't avoid some of these things. And we're going to talk about how you can avoid, how to avoid the things that you can avoid. And by avoiding the unnecessary exposures, you make yourself a lot more resilient to help your body detoxify uh, the things you can't avoid. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about what's been called the postmenopausal female death spiral. And I got this plane is orange for calcium. It's going downhill. She's sort of relying on bogus science and a lot of women when they go into menopause, they have the problems we're gonna talk about here. Calcium supplements are very overrated. Okay, so the dietary death spiral with calcium. So a lot of postmenopausal women are obese. And their obesity is associated with a high fat diet, a lot of estrogenic uh, chemical exposures. They'll often be pre-diabetic or diabetic and they're eating way too much sodium. So anyways, for their hypertension, they get put on a diuretic, it's pretty common treatment. And that will lead to a loss of potassium in the urine and magnesium. So this is a problem. Sodium constricts arteries. It causes the artery to narrow down. That's bad. We're, and potassium and magnesium do the opposite. They open up arteries or vasodilators. So she's going in the wrong direction here. The net effect from the dehydration <clears throat> will be to lower her blood pressure, but her blood's becoming more prothrombotic, more predisposed to clot. A lot of times she's stressed out and, you know, people foolishly will try to compensate for their stress. It'll make them sleep deprived. So then they need caffeine, but that's going to make them more sleep deprived, cause more insomnia, more less ability to sleep deeply. Um, and that stress causes loss of magnesium in the urine. So she's making herself more prothrombotic. Her arteries are getting more constricted and she's typically eating a diet low in potassium and magnesium because they come from plants. Um, and so she gets in a vicious cycle where she just keeps slowly getting worse. She'll never get better down this route. Also, a lot of postmenopausal women, they're overly worried about osteoporosis and they think the answer is to take calcium supplements. Well, calcium has a bit of a seesaw relationship with magnesium. When she's taking in more calcium, uh, she's going to be losing magnesium in the urine. Plus a lot of times we'll go on vitamin D supplements, causing more calcium absorption. And it's not uncommon. They can get their daily calcium intake over 1,400 milligrams a day. That's a lot. Okay. So I just want to show you this paper here. When women had calcium intakes of over 1,400 uh, milligrams per day, their all cause mortality was increased 2.57. So more than two and a half times increase in mortality. They're much more, two and a half times more likely to die, okay? So they mean well, they wanna improve their health, but they're trying for the quick fix. And with chronic diseases, quick fixes almost never work. The real solution is to fix your diet and lifestyle, especially your diet. So we're gonna talk about that, but that, that's big numbers there. You know, she's trying to help herself and she's more than doubling her mortality. Okay, so that's the postmenopausal female dietary death spiral. Um, there's other things that will factor into this. Acidosis from eating animal protein. Um, and it's, it's, it's also associated with kidney stones, all kinds of stuff you don't want. Okay, so what I said is very often 
the person will think they need more protein. That's not the answer. Calcium and the Mediterranean diet is what is recommended by most people who don't really know anything about nutrition, but they think that sounds like the right thing to say. And that's recommended by a lot of people who should know better. A lot of dietitians and physicians recommend the Mediterranean diet. It just seems like the convenient right thing to say, but it's wrong. It's a terrible diet. Okay. It, it includes a lot of uh, meat and oils. It allows alcohol, et cetera. So it's like a Trojan horse. She's got this mindset. And once you, you, you fall into that mindset, unless you correct it, it'll, it'll sort of bring you down. All right. So now a corresponding epidemiology related to this is look at the Bantu women in Africa. Okay. It's very typical. They have about nine children, nine or 10 children, nurse the children for two or three years. Her daily intake of calcium is only about 350 milligrams of calcium per day. That is very low. So they don't have a problem with osteoporosis. Okay. So the point is calcium intake is not the answer. A bone's made out of a lot more than calcium. And you can't just fix a bone problem by eating more calcium. The body sort of is smart. It knows what it needs to absorb. So you give it the foods you're designed to eat and you'll get, your body will do what it's supposed to do. Plus a woman, when she's postmenopausal, she doesn't need to have the same bone mineral density as she did when she was young. You know, a young woman of reproductive age, she's storing those extra minerals in her, in her spine and her other bones so that when she has a baby, they can be given to the baby, some of them, to help the baby. Okay, so why is it that the calcium supplements are thought to be so, um, to increase mortality so much? Well, first of all, they'll cause a transient postprandial uh, increase in calcium, a spike in calcium. And it's a clotting factor, okay? And then you maybe check the blood level of calcium a week later and it's normal, but you had that transient postprandial Postprandial means after eating spike of a clotting factor, which can predispose to thrombosis. Um, learning to manage your stress is important because that makes your blood more prothrombotic. Increases fibrinogen in particular, a very important bridging molecule to cause clots. So it's rather extraordinary. 2.5 times increase all-cause mortality. All right, so now we're going to move to the next topic. The next topic is fluoride. And so I don't know if I, I went through this just briefly that, yeah, my, I got teased about my teeth. I said, okay, I'm going to buy one of those toothpaste. I don't usually brush my teeth with anything. Sometimes I'll brush them with a plain brush just to get off. You have like a little uh, biofilms or slime on there that the bacteria can hide in. You know, if I just don't eat any sweets or soda pop or anything acidic, so it's not a problem. I rinse my teeth off with water, little interdental brushes. I'll always do it at night because at night when you're asleep, your saliva decreases and you're more prone to getting cavities. So you don't, don't want to leave food in your teeth um, at night. Okay. So anyways, when I saw all these toothpaste, they all had this little signs on the package that said fluoride anti-cavity toothpaste. And to me, that was like writing step right up and poison yourself, you dummy. Okay. I couldn't believe it. I mean, this information has been around for a long time, all the problems of fluoride. And I actually almost made me feel sad. I'm like, oh my God, if 99% of the toothpaste on display <clears throat> advertises fluoride on the front cover, that means almost no one knows the problems with this stuff. <clears throat> okay. And so to understand it, you got to go back and learn a little history. Here's a nice painting of Cicero, greatest of all Romans. Okay. And here's what Cicero said. To not know what happened before you were born is to forever remain a child. Okay. That's even called a Ciceronian sentence there to put the conclusion right at the end. And it has more dramatic impact, the professorial style. Okay. Aristotle, he says, if you want to understand something, then study how it was made, where it comes from. Okay. So let's look at fluoride. Fluoride is a halogen. Yeah, so halo means salt, gen means to produce. They're the salt producing um, elements. And what's unique about it is it has an incomplete outer orbital of electrons. It only has seven electrons. So here, this red electron here is unpaired. So when you have an unpaired electron in the outer orbital, it really, 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 really wants to grab another electron because to get eight electrons in this outer orbital is called to complete one's octet, and that makes it more stable. And so fluoride is very aggressive at grabbing electrons. So here's fluoride in the periodic table of elements. And of all the elements, out of every single one of them, fluoride has the highest electronegativity. EN is electronegativity. So it's right here, and it is super high. Right next to it is oxygen, which of course in electron transport within the mitochondria is the ultimate electron acceptor. So it has very high electronegativity too, but fluoride even more so. This vertical column of elements are the halogens. So halo, salt, gens producing, salt producing. And every single one of them is sort of toxic to bacteria. So the halogens kill stuff, okay? And that should tell you something. Fluoride, chlorine, you know, we sanitize pool water and drinking water with chloride, okay? Bromine is also used to sanitize pools. We used to do surgical preps with iodine, okay? So these are all 
toxic. I realize that iodine is incorporated in the thyroid hormone and chlorine is also in our bodies. But just in general, that's important to remember, halogens have a strong tendency to toxicity. And because of this high electronegativity, they really want to grab an electron. And when they grab an electron, fluoride grabs it. It does not give it back. One definition of a pathogenic chemical is that it steals electrons. It steals electrons and it does not give them back. It's just a thief. It is not a giver. It is only a taker. So that's important to know about fluoride. Okay, so fluoride has been used for rat poison, for insecticides. It's put into wood as a preservative. So you tell me, how are you going to take rat poison insecticide and wood preservative and use it to promote human health? Okay, something that kills rats, insects, and fungi is, is that going to be good for health? I don't think so. It was well known up until 1940 as a poison. The aluminum industry had a problem with its uh, waste product of fluoride, as did the phosphate fertilizer companies. So they were able to maneuver a study showing that fluoride had a benefit, they claimed, for teeth. And then they have, you know, they got millions and millions of dollars. The genetic chemical is that it steals or had a benefit, they claimed, for teeth. And then they have, you know, they got... Oops, that was someone that played back. It was playing back. Okay. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll continue here at the next slide. Uh, glucose goes into the uh, cell, and then it goes through glycolysis in the cytoplasm. Then it goes into the mitochondria here. The center of the mitochondria is called the mitochondrial matrix. Um, this is the inner mitochondrial membrane. Here's the outer mitochondrial membrane. This right here is the intramembranous space. That's going to be relevant. Along the inner mitochondrial membrane is ETC, electron transport chain and then oxidative phosphorylation to make ATP. So this is how human cells make energy. Okay, these are the first couple of reactions in glycolysis, which really is sort of the, primarily the six carbon phase. We don't need to get into this, uh, but the second part is relevant for us with fluoride. Fluoride inhibits the enzyme enolase. Enolase is the enzyme in the second half of uh, glycolysis, and that is inhibited by fluoride. So that's an important point. Okay, uh, just another picture of a mitochondria showing the different spaces. The inner part is the matrix, inner mitochondrial membrane, intramembranous space, and then the outer mitochondrial membrane. This is often abbreviated OMM for outer mitochondrial membrane, um, intramembranous space, IMS, inner mitochondrial membrane, IMM. And then, of course, usually just call this a matrix. Okay, so we're not going to get into too much biochemistry, but just to have a little general idea, typically what you're doing is you're constantly pulling hydrogens off these molecules and you're splitting them into a proton and an electron. This is an oversimplification, but it, it, it tells you the key point of what's happening. So glycolysis does that. And we're basically harvesting electrons and protons to use them to make ATP. Okay, and then the same thing happens in Krebs cycle. So I just drew Krebs cycle a couple of different ways. You can see the CO2 is take the carbons from the original sugars are blown off when we exhale in, as the form of CO2. And then the electron energy in these hydrogens split into the proton. A hydrogen molecule basically equals a proton and an electron. That is harvested off. Now, just to show you all the things fluoride does, it inhibits you know, three major enzymes in Krebs cycle. Okay, one, two, three. Conotase, isocitrate, dehydrogenase, succinate, dehydrogenase. Okay, so it's really wreaking havoc with metabolism. This is a quick summary of what electron transport's all about. It's kind of like firemen in a bucket brigade. They transfer electrons from complex number one, all the way down to complex number four. And as it moves from complex to complex, the desire to grab electrons becomes stronger and stronger. Like oxygen, we showed had a very high electronegativity. It was a very strong pull for electrons. So it's just rolling downhill, these electrons. And as they roll downhill, they're used to power a pump system. And the pump takes the proton from those original, remember we talked about those original hydrogens split off from the, the sugar molecules, the glucose. The protons are pumped into the intramembranous space and you build up a big gradient there. And then at the end of electron transport, you have an ATP synthase that harvests the gradient. And when that hydrogen comes back in, the proton comes back in, excuse me, that energy spins this enzyme, ATP synthase, and ATP, ADP, adenosine diphosphate, is phosphorylated to ATP. ATP is the energy of the cell. That is like a $20 bill to a human. That is what ATP is. So this is how energy is made in humans. And that's about... 95% of the ATB in a normal human is made that way, which is all of our energy. We make tons of it every day. Okay, so this just shows the same thing in a, you know, a little bit more spread out fashion. Here's the outer mitochondrial membrane, inner mitochondrial membrane, intramembranous space, complex one pumping its proton and all the other complexes. And then here's ATP synthase, you know, adding this phosphate to the ADP to make ATP, the energy of the cell. Okay, 
And the reason this is relevant is fluoride will inhibit complex four. So it's an inhibitor of mitochondrial function of electron transport. And that becomes relevant because if you're drinking fluoridated water, you're having that happen every single day. When you drink one part per million, which is a common amount in, in fluoridated water, you're drinking about two milligrams per day. Adults will typically keep about half of it in their body and excrete the other half in their urine of, of the amount that's absorbed. Um, and it gets more complicated because sometimes they'll increase the dose all the way up to four parts per million. And it's often combined with aluminum because they'll use aluminum in the water as a clarifier. Well, aluminum is a neurotoxin for the brain. So that's not good. And fluoride will bind with the aluminum and it makes it more lipophilic, more fat-like. And that increases its ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. So as it crosses the blood-brain barrier, um, it can cause, um, you know, over time, uh, dysfunction to brain neurons. And lots of drugs have fluoride in them for several reasons. It can increase the half-life of the drug because it'll inhibit the liver detoxifying it, you know, liver hydroxylation and the P450 cytochrome enzyme. So it can inhibit that and increase the half-life of the drug. It can also increase the ability of the drug to cross the blood-brain barrier. Okay. Um, it is a waste product of aluminum production. And so, I mean, how convenient to put aluminum and F minus, the aluminum companies love this into the water. Okay. And, you know, some studies do show a small reduction in dental cavities, but for that small benefit, there's a lot of other problems. I personally recommend to avoid fluoride as much as you can. Um, also, once an association gets committed to something, here's just some terminology if you want that. Once an association gets committed to something, it's usually hard for them to change their original position. So, they won't change their opinion, the American Dental Association. Another thing is fluoride will bind to proteins and it will distort their shape. It can substitute itself for a hydrogen on the side of a protein. It especially likes to bind to these positively charged amino acid side chains, lysine, arginine, and histidine. Once it binds to the protein, it'll distort the shape of the protein. And for this reason, distortion of the protein shape, it can confuse the body. The body recognizes proteins by their shape. So if it distorts the shape of a protein on the outer surface of a cell, it can uh, make it no longer recognizable by the immune system. And so it can become what is called a PAMP. PAMP means pathogen associated molecular patterns. And then the immune system might attack the tissue. It can also be a DAMP that's damage associated molecular patterns where damaged tissue is cleaned up by the immune system. But the real key thing here is it can cause autoimmune disease. So the relevance is if someone has an autoimmune disease, another thing they could do to try to optimize their health would be avoiding fluoride because it might be putting them at risk for developing more of these PAMPs situations where they'll have uh, auto antibodies uh, formed to tissue and uh, that can cause them some problems. Okay, F minus accelerates calcification of arterial walls. I can tell you, I see tons and tons of arterial calcification all day and it's multifactorial primarily from atherosclerosis, but this contributes to it. It's also going to cause a lot of calcification of the ligaments in the spine. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Um, collagen is the major protein in the human body. It's the glue of the human body. And fluoride interrupts uh, collagen synthesis. And because of that, uh, you'll get more breakdown products from collagen in the urine when a person is ingesting fluoride. Even with just as small as one part per million, they're going to get increased hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine in their blood. These are unique amino acids in collagen because they're, they're initially the protein is synthesized, okay, translated. And then post translational, you'll get hydroxylation of proline to form hydroxyproline, hydroxylation of lysine to form hydroxylysine. And fluoride is interrupting this. So it's, it's damaging the collagen. And this can be easily detected by checking these uh, amino acids, the unique, these unique amino acids in the urine, hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine. Uh, when you have poor collagen in arterial walls, that increases your risk of aneurysm formation. Okay. Um, it also weakens bone. It's complex what it does to the spine. I'll get into that in a little later. Okay. So now what I'm showing is there's more uh, mitochondrial toxins. We talked about F minus, dietary fat especially saturated fat tends to block complex three, cadmium complex three. Um, so all these things start adding up and that's why you want to optimize whatever you can because there's always going to be some problems happening in the background. You want to minimize your, your vulnerability, your sensitivity to those problems. Okay, when F minus damages mitochondrial function, that is an effect similar to what hypoxia does, what excessive saturated fat does. Um, and this increases the risk of cancer, Okay. We talked about it, the effects of uh, F minus toxicity potentiated by albumin, and they're both in tap water. They're also both in tea, and they're sometimes both in soy. 
Okay, so that's worth knowing about. All right, and then this slide is called how F minus toxicity happens in real life, that it's multifactorial and you can have synergistic negative effects. So you can have you can have the simultaneous effects of a high fat meal, elevated uric acid, let's say from excessive alcohol ingestion or excessive high fructose corn syrup, uh, sweetened beverage will increase uric acid. The person's stressed out, they're drinking caffeine, they're sleep deprived, excessive dietary sodium, F minus in their drinking water. It's also transdermally absorbed. So you shower in it, you're going to absorb that transdermally. And then there's a lot of F minus in tea. Some studies show increased amounts in soy. You got a lot of F minus in drugs. Then aluminum is added to the water. Then a lot of people are eating a lot of omega-6 fats with a processed food diet. That produces hydroxynon and all the toxic aldehyde. I talked about that in a previous lecture, my dementia lecture. So what I'm saying is all these things are adding up to be harmful to brain cells. And also many of them to contribute to having causing tissue hypoxia, which increases cancer risk. And not to mention these things over here, uh, which are also uh, have neurotoxic effects. The good news is a plant-based diet, low-fat plant-based diet helps to prevent all this because it gives you the vasodilators to reopen those arteries, the potassium and the magnesium. It gives you the vitamin C antioxidants and other antioxidants to help counter effect the oxidation effects because it's an oxidant fluoride um, in that way. A lot of the researchers who research fluoride, many of them died from the toxicity of fluoride. It's pretty toxic stuff. So here's just another slide showing additional toxins um, and how they affect the uh, mitochondrial transport here. So now you've got GP glyphosate from Roundup. Uh, you got lead. Um, you got hydroxynanol. So all of these things start adding up. So what I'm basically saying is you want to minimize, you can minimize what you can, you know, eating organic, you can lower the cadmium a little bit, minimizing your dietary fat, especially sad fat, you'll avoid this, avoiding F minus in your water, um, avoiding tea. These are ways to lower these things. Only, eating only organic avoids that. Okay, so one of the things you'll see when you read the research on its subject is when there's something that, you know, maybe a company doesn't want you to know about, it'll be behind a paywall. You can't get the paper. So mechanism fluoride toxicity, all it gets an abstract. Um, we talked about it disrupting collagen, um, easily crosses the blood-brain barrier. Um, it also, because it's an oxidant and it damages the mitochondria, it increases reactive oxygen species. They call it ROS. It increases the incidence of Down syndrome, um, increases hyperactivity, attention deficit, learning disabilities in the brain, has multiple toxic effects on the brain. Um, and you'll find it's not just one study. There's lots and lots of these studies. Um, here's a study coming out of China, and it shows that when this is given to children, it decreases their mental work capacity. And I see that a lot in, in younger people is they just don't have the concentration. Um, and so, you know, if you're going to do good intellectual work, you have to maintain your attention, your focus. Um, here's another study. The higher the F minus in the water, the lower the IQs in the children. And there's study after study like this. Um, and then, like we said, it's routinely um, combined with elevated aluminum in the in the water and aluminum is also a brain toxin so there's two neurotoxins affecting the brain right away just from drinking water that's why people go oh you need eight cups a day well it certainly depend matters what you're drinking i wouldn't i don't worry about eight cups a day i go by my thirst okay if you're drinking eight cups a day of aluminum and fluoride and estrogenics in your water i don't think that's going to help your health okay i get my my hydration from just eating plant foods they're very uh well hydrated you know fruits and vegetables and starches okay all right, aluminum fluoride uh, in rats. Let's see what this one is, you know, more of the same thing. Okay, here's the study in Mexico, same study. You elevate uh, uh, fluoridated water, they get more lower IQs. Um, and babies, young children are more vulnerable because their blood-brain barrier is not formed yet. Okay, is baby formula safe? Yeah, a lot of baby formulas are toxic. It comes in an aluminum can, the aluminum itself is neurotoxic. It'll have a BPA lining on the aluminum can, and that's estrogenic. So that's an estrogen endocrine disrupting chemical. That's toxic. There's If it's reconstituted with F minus water, hopefully they're not doing that anymore. But if it is, and they used to be, uh, that's another neurotoxin. Uh, the corn syrup, which is used often sweeten things, those often have mercury in them. Atrazine is what's sprayed typically in producing corn, uh, non-organic corn, and that's highly estrogenic. So that's endocrine disrupting. Um, the soy protein isolates that has endocrine properties, estrogenic properties. Um, if it's non-organic, it'll often have GP in it, which can have all kinds of harmful effects. Um, these PUFA oils cause lipid peroxidation. They are not healthy. 
Um, if omega-3 is added to it, which theoretically sounds good, but it's often extracted in that way with hexane and soy is often processed with hexane. That's a neurotoxin. So what I'm saying is this stuff is toxic to the poor little baby's brain. Um, Dr. McDougall has a nice newsletter on the best baby food. And he recommends the best one being this protein hydrosylate, hypoallergenic cow's milk. So it's, that's his newsletter from March. Just go to his drmood.com. You can check that out. He's raised grandchildren already. So he's got a lot of experience with it. Um, so you really want to study that carefully because, you know, give the kid a chance. If a woman could breastfeed, it would be good for her to breastfeed for at least six months. Okay. More toxic. We talked about that because infants don't have an adequately formed blood brain barrier. Um, and this article says basically it damages almost all brain structures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that's pretty bad. All right. So I, I'm telling you this because it's important to get that. This is not some isolated fringe thought. This is widespread, extensively documented research. All right. More research on China showing the neurotoxicity of fluoride, higher F minus exposure, lower IQs. There's paper after paper after paper. Here's more of the same thing. Neurobehavioral development. Um, the effect of high F minus, it is toxic to high to neural development. Okay. F minus in rats causes visible damage with microscope to the brain, neocortex, hippocampus, and spinal cord. Okay. F minus is toxic to the brain in multiple ways and causes apoptosis, programmed cell death. It easily crosses the blood brain barrier. That's why it's a lot of neuropsychopharmaceuticals to get the drug into the across the blood brain barrier. Okay. They cross the blood-brain barrier and then it can kill neurons. This is so bad. Plants give you what you want to protect you from fluoride. They give you the antioxidants like vitamin C, for example. They give you the vasodilators to increase blood flow so you can get more um, of your helpful stuff, your oxygen and your healing WBCs there to help protect these cells. Um, I think of magnesium as M for magnesium, M for mellow. It's the mellow out hormone. It also helps block the NMDA receptor for glutamate and that's a good thing. It stabilizes that receptor. So you avoid excitotoxicity types of effects. I talked about that in my, my dementia lecture. Um, and, and this is what's so bad about fluoride. It doesn't just do one bad thing that you can prevent. It does numerous bad things. It's sort of insidious. There's no easy way to prevent this other than avoiding it. Um, and also, like I said, living as healthy as you can and everything you can control makes your body more resilient, able to defend itself from the toxic effects of fluoride. Okay, um, it inhibits the, the K and ATPA. So that's the K is for potassium, kalium in Latin is potassium, um, N is for natrium, which is for sodium, and the K and ATPAs. In your brain cells, your neurons, 65% of their energy is for this potassium, sodium, ATPAs. Um, so that's super important. That's the most important thing in your neuron and fluoride's inhibiting that. So you can imagine it's not good for function. Um, okay, it's associated with all these eye problems too, age-related macular degeneration, cataracts, glaucoma. Uh, tea can be a significant source of fluoride. It has a tendency to concentrate fluoride. Tea can also concentrate um, aluminum. Okay, so here's the American Dental Association. And the American Dental Association says they support fluoridation as does the American Medical Association, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the World Health Organization. Okay, so my opinion is, you know, once these organizations commit to something, they will not change their position. They're afraid of the legal implications of that. But my point of view is, you know, when new information, that might've been a reasonable position back in 1945, 1950, but all this additional information has come out and it's well-documented. I think, you know, uh, an individual can look at this information and say, you know what? I don't think this is a good idea. Numerous papers associating it with hypothyroidism. They're both halogens, fluoride and iodine. And it disrupts the process of iodine uptake and uh, incorporation into thyroid hormone. So it, you know, and something that causes hypothyroidism, which can have this type of effect on the mother, for example, when a woman is hypothyroid during a pregnancy, the baby is more likely to be born mentally retarded. Okay. It, it can have a lot of significant effects and hypothyroidism in other individuals and say an adult, you know, cause fatigue can cause decreased memory and other side effects as well. Um, in communities with F minus water, there's two times increased incidence of hypothyroidism. Um, and from this book on how fluoride is killing you, he says, the literature is full of reports of studies of wild animals, farm animals, and humans with increased incidence of thyroid goiter uh, when F minus is present. They're exposed to F minus. Okay. Um, like I said, some soy beverages will have a tendency to concentrate F minus. 
Um, tea, even the so even the green tea can be really high sometimes in F minus. Tea can also concentrate aluminum. It can be neurotoxic. That's why I avoid tea. A lot of people think tea is a health food. I avoid the stuff. I would never drink it. Um, soy sometimes can concentrate these things according to some of these papers. Um, here's the references for all this stuff down here. Um, we talked about tap water having aluminum and F minus. Uh, wine, grape juice, and raisins, often grapes, can sometimes have a problem in these areas. Watch out for baking soda. It can sometimes have very high aluminum baking powders, baking powder. Okay, efflective fluoride on the central nervous system. Just one part per million can be surprisingly toxic. And it can have a slow insidious effect that doesn't show up for 20 years later. So it sort of weakens a person. Uh, also, you don't want to be cooking on these Teflon things. Teflon can put the nonstick cookware can get that fluoride into your food. Tons of fluoride in toothpaste, dental gels. You want to avoid all that stuff, the fluoridated toothpaste. Also, if you've got amalgams, you know, previous silver hyphen mercury fillings in your teeth, brushing with uh, fluoridated toothpaste on them, according to this paper, increases mercury release from the amalgam. So that's not good. Um, another paper related saying the same thing. And then holding a cell phone to your mouth will also increase corrosion and dental amalgam. So it's better to use a speaker phone. You know, of course, it's a small amount, but it potentially adds up over time. So here's a study just <clears throat> about holding a cell phone to your mouth, causing more loss of mercury from your amalgams. Um, and here's a country, Ireland, for example, where their water is fluoridated and they also drink a lot of tea. And what the paper says is habitual tea drinking can, can, can contribute significantly to increasing fluoride and get you up over you know, higher levels where it becomes more dangerous. Okay, this quickly sort of summarizes some of the things we talked about. If anybody wants to look at it, I kind of have little extra information on the word slide. So if somebody really like wants to look at it more, there's, there's more information here on some of the details. We're going to talk about the effects on bone. This is what we were talking about with collagen. Collagen is the most common protein in the body. It's like 30% of the body's protein. It's like the glue that holds the entire body together. If you bought like a model set, how to build a human, the glue would be collagen for everything. And it prevents hydroxylation of proline. So we were talking about hydroxyproline being a super common amino acid in collagen necessary to make collagen. And so when, you, when you're when you not getting adequate amounts of hydroxyproline into your collagen, it's non-functional. You get stiffening of joints, contributing to arthritis. Um, it causes more wrinkling of skin. So it accelerates the aged appearance of a person. Um, F minus injury to collagen is similar in some ways to scurvy. You know, vitamin C deficiency also decreases one's ability to synthesize collagen. Um, we talked about combination with that. Also, you know, kids have died from just <clears throat> a fluoride treatment in the dentist's office. If they swallow it accidentally, that can be very dangerous. You look at the container directions on, on fluoride toothpaste, it'll say, use only a pea-sized amount, a tiny, tiny amount. And if you swallow it, call poison control, okay? They know it's poisonous, all right? Come on. Um, it kind of makes people sort of stupid and lazy is one of the effects, apathetic, lethargic. Um, and I think a lot of people I've noticed, I've been amazed in my adult life, how many people, they don't ever want to read a book. You know, they've given up on themselves. A lot of people, they're fat and they're sick and they're just like, oh, well, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, become a vegan. That's what you should do. But they don't listen to me. Also, it causes, it can cause atrophy of pituitary. I just know from experience, I've seen tons and tons of brains, thousands of brains. It's very, very common to see atrophic pituitary. Now, I don't know if that's from F minus, but I can tell you atrophic pituitary is a common thing. It also um, increases the rate of calcification in the pineal gland, which is located in the brain in the midline posteriorly. And I see calcified pineal glands, you know, all the time, every day. And that is associated, they claim these articles with premature pu puberty, Okay. Um, it also is in, important for making melatonin for sleep. So it can't be helping a person sleep. Um, damages the hippocampus, the memory center. That's not good. That's going to lower your ability to remember things and to think, uh, when fed to pregnant animals in this Mullenix study, it made them hyperactive kind of sounds like ADHD. Uh, she published a big study showing all these problems with fluoride. This lady was a big researcher. I think her name was Phyllis Mullenix and she got fired from her job for that. And that's another bad thing. And that's not uncommon when researchers publish big papers that show the negative side of something that's highly profitable for a big company, the researcher will get fired. Okay. They'll just pressure the institution, whoever hires that person to fire them. So that's not good. F minus in water increases the risk of down syndrome. Um, when water has more than one part per million, there's at least two times increased incidence of down syndrome. Um, let's see. Talked about all this. Okay, it increases cancer risk. Overall, 
um, these two uh, doctors did a research study, Yeo Muyanis and Burke, and they found that in comparison to demographically matched fluoridated and non-fluoridated water of cities, there was a 10% increased risk of cancer death. So they went by cancer death. You can't go by diagnosis because there could be variations in how cancer is diagnosed, but to go by the cancer death rate, that's a relatively reproducible number. And they found a recurring 10% increased risk of cancer death. Okay, so that's not good. Other papers showing increased uh, tumor growth from uh, the effect of sodium fluoride. Um, it decreases immune function. It can decrease uh, white blood cell ability to prevent infections. Um, and, there, and there's such a push. It's so profitable to put this stuff in the food. It's not even funny. So you got to be careful to avoid it. It, it gets put into salt. So <laughs> I recommend don't add salt to your food. <laughs> don't be surprised if there's F minus in there. It gets added to some milks. Um, like I said, soy can sometimes concentrate F minus and concentrate aluminum. So you got to be careful about that. And then here's a nice painting. This one is called Reflections on the Thames by John Atkinson Grimshaw, okay, from 1880. It's a beautiful picture of the Thames River in, in London, Big Ben over there. And why I'm showing this is that I can remember all these people are all saying, I want city water. I want city water. I don't want to deal with a well. Well, guess what? Well water that doesn't contain F minus, if it doesn't have other problems with it, is going to be better for you, okay? And you want to try to get this stuff out of your water. How do you avoid it? First of all, don't go looking for it. You know, don't get dental treatments with F minus. Don't use F minus toothpaste. Um, human body has zero need for it. You don't need to have any F minus in your body at all. Um, you can move to a place where you can get well water that doesn't have F minus in it. Make sure you test it first. You can remove it from water with reverse osmosis or with distillation. Um, it's hard to remove it from your whole house. You know, you're not going to have a whole, that's going to be too expensive to get a whole house <clears throat> RO filter. And distillation is kind of cumbersome. It can take hours to, to make uh, F minus water with distillation, but it's effective. But there's other issues with the hypoosmolarity. Um, take shorter, less frequent showers because it's absor absorbed transdermally and you inhale some of it as well. This is another reason why I think swimming is overrated as a hobby. You know, I've been around a lot of athletes in my life and I met the smartest ones, athletes I've ever met in my life were these cross country runners because I think the determination to run sort of a three mile race is a standard distance in high school cross country um, or, you know, longer races with older persons. It's just like kind of very much like the discipline to study. Um, so I've met really smart runners. I, have, I haven't met too many smart swimmers. You know, I went to Stanford, which is like one of the best swimming schools and swimmers, you know, they're, 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 they're not as smart as runners. They just aren't. And in my ex personal experience, don't get me wrong. I'm sure there's some exception to that, but they're breathing all this F minus aluminum in their water all day long, that can't be good for their health. Okay. I don't think it's good for their health. All right. Um, your clothing, if it's washed in F minus water, that's not great. Uh, we talked about that. Okay. What else? How to avoid uh, fluoride, avoid the foods that have a tendency to contain it. Be careful about taking medicines that contain it. Watch out for these baking powders. Um, I don't even like fluorescent lights for that reason, even though that's probably a, a minor issue. That's that's sort of a different subject. So I'm not going to get into that. I have no idea. That might be more of a potential other thing, mercury or something from those lights. That's kind of why I thought of that. Um, cigarette smoke can be high in that. Fine. If you're near a factory with coal burning electrical plants or putting it into the air, aluminum smelters, phosphate fertilizer companies, and even some of these other types of factories. In general, you don't want to live near a factory if you can avoid it. Maybe put air filters in your house for what that's worth. I don't know how much they're going to help, but for what that's worth, I would do that. Um, we talked about the benefits of a plant diet with all the vitamin C, antioxidants and whatnot. I would avoid aluminum as much as you can. There's good reason to believe that contributes significantly to dementia, even though there's obviously more to dementia than that. Here's a whole bunch of references if you're curious, more references. Okay, so that's it for the standard stuff on F minus. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about F minus in the spine. F minus in the spine. Well, first of all, here's just a standard anatomy of the lumbar spine. So here's S2, sacral vertebra number two, S1, sacral vertebra number one. Here's L5, lumbar spine, L4, L3. L anyway, I jumped to the next one, but it doesn't really matter. Um, here is the abdominal aorta, which runs down in front of the spine, and it gives off a lumbar artery at the mid height of the vertebral body. This lumbar artery then drops a twig down to the inferior end plate, and this is called the upper end plate, and this is the lower end plate. The disc does not have any blood vessels, but it is alive. The disc runs an anaerobic glycolysis. It gets its oxygen and glucose, well, it gets its glucose by 
um, diffusion from the end plate. And that helps the disc to stay intact. Um, and you want that disc to be intact. As a person accumulates atherosclerosis, typically it's on the posterior wall of the abdominal aorta and it'll start to narrow. It's called stenosis and occlude the lumbar artery. Once this lumbar artery becomes stenosed, narrowed and occluded, then it can't get adequate blood flow down to the end plate, which means you don't get enough blood flow to the disc and the disc will start to fail. That's called degenerative disc disease. It is super, super, super common. It's ubiquitous. Um, when the disc fails, it's gonna cause a whole cascade of problems in the spine. Okay, this is just sort of the anatomy here. You know, again, L5, L4, and L3, lumbar vertebra three, lumbar vertebra four, lumbar vertebra five, sacral vertebra one. That's the anatomy of the lumbar spine. Okay, so here's what's happening when a disc fails. The outer ring of the disc, the outer surface, here we're looking at it sort of in a, from above, if you will, in a cross section. In the center, it's like a jelly donut. And the nucleus pulbosus is like the jelly of a jelly donut. When you tear the outer part, that's called the annulus fibrosus, annulus fibrosus here, you can then get extrusion of the jelly donut out into the outer annulus fibrosus, and it can even go beyond it. But the point is, when the steel belted radial tire fails, disc material heads out into the periphery of the disc, and there are nerves that innervate this, sinovertebral nerves, so they sense pain. Here's what it looks like on a side view, the sagittal view of a lumbar spine MRI. And you can see that you'll have hyperintensity because nucleus pulposus, um, the fluid-like component is high signal on a T2 MRI. T2 sequence MRI, that's called an annular fissure. They used to call it an annular tear, but that implies trauma. So they now just call it an annular fissure. And that can be painful in and of itself. And this disc herniation become bigger and bigger and, and push on the nerves um, in the canal and cause more pain. The end plates, by the way, are cartilaginous. So they don't have the best blood plate to begin with. Center is more typical bone, has better, uh, better blood flow. So anyways, Ischemia, lack of blood flow to the disc, causing failure, causing a crack in the annulus fibrosis, causing herniation and nucleus pulposus. This will also dry out and become desiccated. And then the disc will lose height. That's called a degenerated disc. And this disc based narrowing will then lead to the bone having to bear more weight because the disc cannot support much weight. Um, when the disc is not supporting enough weight, it'll often have abnormal motion at that level. The spine has an important job to protect the central nervous system. And it protects the central nervous system um, by make, keeping those bones intact. So what'll happen is it'll form these osteophytes. By the way, this slide got a little distorted, but I think the main point can still be made here. The vertebrae above forms an osteophyte that grows down to the vertebrae below and it fuses them. So what's happening is the disc is no longer able to do its job and sort of hold these uh, vertebrae together and support a lot of weight. So now the vertebra fuses itself by forming these osteophytes and they're called bridging osteophytes because the one from above forms a bridge to the one from below. And this causes a condition called DISH, D-I-S-H, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis. This is super, super, super common. I actually wrote a book about this called Most Common Cause of Back Pain is Ischemic Spine. And so what happens is as this level fails, then there's increased pressure on the adjacent level, that will fail. Increased pressure on the adjacent level, that will fail. And this process will work its way all the way from the pelvis, all the way up to the skull. Um, these pictures are actually two separate pictures here. This is showing the abdominal aorta and thoracic aorta down into the abdominal aorta. And these orange spots are calcifications. And the more calcified this gets, the more atherosclerosis there is narrowing those lumbar arteries. And the worse the, these, uh, the ischemia, the lack of blood supply to the spine becomes. So as I was saying, these bridging little uh, black lines here, these bridging osteophytes will extend all the way from the sacrum, all the way up the thoracic spine, all the way up the cervical spine into the skull. And as the spine becomes fused, these discs will become more and more dysfunctional and they will calcify. So fusing the two vertebral bodies is called interbody fusion. Then you'll get calcification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And the abbreviation for that is OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. Ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament. And just to give you a little perspective, back when I was a resident, in the you know, 1990s, the textbook would say, OPLL is a very rare disorder, more common in Asians, you know, well, BS, okay? I see this all day long, every single day. It is super common. More common, I'll see it in the um, cervical spine, but I see it a lot in the lumbar spine. Calcifications of the posterior disc margin. And it's all the same process. It's an attempt to autofuse the spine to protect it from segmental instability. So a segment is a vertebra above and below and it's disc. That is a spinal segment. When there's abnormal motion there, these vertebral osteophytes, calcification is laid down to bridge these vertebrae together. 
and eventually you'll get intrabody bridging and you'll get OPLL, ossification posterior longitudinal ligament, to fuse these vertebrae together. And as this happens, you can imagine all these vertebrae being fused together, the spine becomes much more stiff. That's painful and it's uncomfortable for the person. Um, so you get these old people, their spines are stiff and they don't want to exercise because it hurts. And as they exercise less, their muscles atrophy and they're very prone to falling down and getting terrible fractures because the vertebral body itself is going to be osteoporotic. I'll show some x-rays here in a little bit. Okay, here's a better picture showing the uh, thoracic and abdominal aorta with the calcifications. That's going to cause atherosclerosis of the lumbar arteries that would extend like this. The spine gets segmental instability, and then you get autofusion throughout the entire spine. This is end stage failed spine, kind of like what congestive heart failure is to the heart. This is the equivalent of uh, spine failure, and it's super common. Again, you'll see this all day long, every day. And the main thing causing this is ischemia from atherosclerosis. But guess what? F minus also contributes to this. And that's why I'm showing you because F minus contributes to causing DISH and OPLL. Okay. Um, so here's some papers on skeletal fluorosis from NAF, sodium aluminum fluoride. And you got these bridging osteophytes of the spine. Uh, I usually would have preferred if they flipped these x-rays. I always like to read from left to right, but you steal it nevertheless. Here's the bridging osteophytes between these vertebral bodies. Here's the disc base. Here's the vertebra. This would be the inferior end plate, superior end plate. And here's an, a bridging osteophyte. And you see it at multiple levels working its way up the spine. So the researchers felt that this was caused by fluoride. And what I'm saying is it's also more commonly caused by ischemia, but they both cause it. So the F minus is causing a lot of problems for the spine. Um, and I'll explain how that predisposes to fractures in a moment. Here it is in the cervical spine, uh, bridging osteophytes on the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. Um, you can see it over here, uh, bridging osteophytes in this paper on the anterior aspect of the vertebral body. And here it is again, bridging osteophytes. So what happens is now these bridging osteophytes are bearing more and more of the weight. So the vertebra bears less weight. There's something called the Wolf-Parkinson-White Law, whereby the more weight a vertebra bears, the more it becomes mineralized, the stronger it gets. So when you got the osteophytes supporting the weight instead of the vertebra, the vertebra becomes demineralized or osteoporotic. And that predisposes it to fracture. So I've seen these guys just fall down from going from a chair to let's say a little motorized wheelchair. And they'll fracture their spine and they'll often fracture all the way through from front to back through their cord and become paraplegic. Those are called chalk stick fractures. That's sort of the medical word for it. Autofuse spine with a chalk stick fracture. And like I said, this has been known for a long time. Here's 1937, this paper was written. And there's so much overlap from dish and skeletal fluorosis that you can't always tell them apart. Skeletal fluorosis will tend to have more of an osteosclerosis effect, but there's a lot of overlap. It's the same patients have both diseases. So here it causes calcification of ligaments. One can see that. And here's a, a bulky uh, posterior disc. You can have this from disc bulge, but it was felt to be OPLL in this case, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. You can see it at multiple levels and it tends to extend beyond the disc space, not just at the disc space. And it's compressing the spinal cord. There's a little uh, hyperintensity. This is a T2 MRI sequence because fluid is bright. So there's some hyperintensity in the cord. So this is spinal cord compression due to OPLL related to fluorosis. Okay. Um, this looks like a disc herniation down here. So that's another reason why you can compress the cord, but that's a different thing. HMP is just herniated nucleus pulposus. Okay, same patient. has got, as we showed here, calcification, ossification of ligaments, uh, calcification, ossification of the interosseous membrane there and some muscle attachments, dental fluorosis with uh, discoloration of the teeth. Okay, so now we're having an intermission. So we, now we've reached, we're actually more than halfway done with the talk, but we're gonna transition to a new topic. And for this intermission here, I, th I thought this painting was kind of cool. This is Ulysses and the Sirens by John William Waterhouse. So Ulysses knew that they were passing through an area where all these sirens were going to try to talk him into doing something he didn't want to do. So he had himself tied to the mast though because he wanted to hear him. The, the sailors have their ears wrapped, so hopefully they won't hear. This guy's putting his hands up not to hear the sirens. So I'm kind of joking for the average person as regards to nutrition. They'll hear the sirens saying things like, Take a calcium supplement. It's good for your bones. F minus is good for your teeth. Keto, paleo, carb. That's what the sirens are telling you on the internet. And all the paleo keto views, they've got a million views for everybody promoting low fat vegan diet. So don't listen to them. They're just going to lead you into something you don't want. Okay. Also, I made one thing too, is that you have to be able to trust yourself. Okay. For example, you know, I trust myself. If I look at a painting, I like it or I don't, okay? And a lot of people try to tell you, oh, isn't this a great Picasso? I don't think so. I don't like it. And I trust yourself. If you like it, fine. But if you don't, you don't. 
learn to trust yourself. Don't always just believe some expert because they'll tell you all kinds of things. They'll tell you, you know, F minus is good for you. Okay. And what you need to remember is you have to be able to say to yourself, you know, two plus two equals four. I know what I feel. I know what I see. And I believe it because People don't trust themselves and they just say, well, I'll go to whatever the expert is. Well, the expert's going to make $120,000 of doing open heart surgery on you. You better think about that before you commit yourself to something that you could have fixed by just improving your diet. Okay. And then here's a painting of a circus and the old Monty Python line for transitions and now for something completely different. Okay. So the second part of this talk here, we're going to talk about really the third part of the talk. The talk has three parts. And this here is about fluoride. I'm sorry, now we're done with fluoride. Now we're going to talk about sodium and potassium. All of the attention goes to sodium. Sodium, 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 high salt, hypertension, high sodium, increased gastric cancer and other problems, sodium, sodium, sodium. And here's a little secret I'm going to tell you. The secret of hypertension is that it's easy to improve this situation for vegans. And here it is. Potassium is more important than sodium. So everybody talks about sodium, but if you think about potassium, everything makes a lot more sense and you'll know what to do to help yourself. K factor is the ratio of potassium. K for kalium in Spanish means uh, potassium. N for natrium means sodium from the Latin. So you want your K factor to always be greater than five. If you keep your K factor greater than five, you're probably going to have a very good blood pressure. Our ancestors actually had K factors. You know, Richard Moore, he wrote the best book on hypertension called The High Blood Pressure Solution. The guy's an MD, PhD, who researched his entire life, wrote brilliant, brilliant books about it. The best stuff ever written on the subject of hypertension by far. Anyways, he said, you keep your K factor over five. He actually said four would probably be okay, but five is a, a little, gives you a little safety margin. Our ancestors were probably, eating, he thought at least 15, K factors of 15. I think it's probably more like 20, 20 times more potassium than sodium. Dennis Burkett had said, there's no animal other than humans that eats more sodium than uh, potassium. This is an essential fact. So remember this. This is this is sort of like your guiding light to get you through the, the, the difficulties of hypertension. The K factor is your friend. Okay, the reason is it's a vasodilator and it gets the sodium potassium pumps to work better. Well, I'll explain why in just a moment, but this is an essential point. Um, plant foods, lots of plant foods routinely have, you know, 10 to 1, 20 to 1, or even more to that uh, potassium to sodium. Okay, hypertension is kind of like the gateway disease to all this metabolic syndrome and coronary artery disease and strokes. Um, the main things causing it are excessive dietary fat and sodium. And then there's sort of two camps on this, the dietary fat group, and especially Dr. McDougall emphasizes that. Um, Dr. Pritik, I mean, Nathan Pritik intended to emphasize that. Um, there's also the sodium school of thought. And Richard Moore emphasizes sodium. There's other uh, speakers who emphasize sodium. You know, Chef AJ had a, a, a doctor on recently who really emphasized the effect of sodium. Uh, Walter Kempner emphasized both. The rice has only 1% protein as rice and fat's very low and fruit's very low in um, protein. So he, and fat. So Kempner lowered both the dietary fat and the sodium. He got incredibly results, magnificent results in treating hypertension. Okay, you know, a baby's born about 90 over 60. Ideal blood pressure is really probably more like 110 over 80, but you want to be below 120 over 80. The lower, the better if you feel good. Um, McDougall, Dr. McDougall doesn't treat unless a person is consistently over 150 or so. Um, this is called the Winkessel effect, the ascending thoracic aorta. Here's the heart. The left ventricle contracts, pushes blood into the thoracic aorta. This is the ascending thoracic aorta segment. It's then distended outward by the pressure of the contraction. And it has elastic fibers here that recoil inwards during heart relaxation. Heart relaxation is called diastole. And during that relaxation, the elastic fibers with the elastic recall propel blood during uh, diastole, during the relaxing phase of the heart. So that's how you get systole. Systole means contraction. So systolic hypertension, so I'm sorry, systolic blood pressure is the number on top when you see your blood pressure written due to heart contraction. Diastole is the number on the bottom, and that's especially related to elastic recoil. All right, this slide got a little distorted, uh, but I think the key point was, here it is. Here's the blood pressure, systolic on top, diastolic on the bottom. Systolic for heart contraction, diastolic for heart relaxation. And this wind castle effect is very important. You can't replace those fibers of the ascending thoracic aorta, elastic fibers after maturity, let's say around your early 20s. So the more you have chronic hypertension, the less likely you're gonna have recovery of your wind castle effect, and the more you're gonna lose it and then you're going to have chronic uh, problems with your diastolic pressure. 
Okay, red blood cells in the ballpark of about seven microns. Capillaries are in the ballpark of about five microns, a little smaller than the red blood cells. So red blood cells have to fold back on themselves to form a little bit to pass through the capillary. So flexibility of a red blood cell also helps to lower pressure. If the RBCs are stiff, then you have to increase pressure to pump them through the small vessels. Okay, most of the cells in the blood are red blood cells. There's like about 700 red blood cells for every WBC. So it's more than 99% um, our, our red blood cells. So if you have a test tube filled with blood, you have the red blood cells right here. That's a hematocrit. Then you're going to have the white blood cells called the Buffy coat in here and then the plasma above. So the higher the hematocrit, uh, the thicker the blood, the more cellular it's going to be. And that's also thought to be why some of these bicycle riders that were taking Epoetin to increase their hematocrit so they do better in the Tour de France and other bike races. When they were at rest, their blood was so thick with hematocrits, well over 50, they were you know, clotting off their coronary arteries, having a heart attack. Okay, um, the zeta potential is a negative charge in the outer surface of a red blood cell. There's proteins on the outer surface of red blood cell, uh, and it's called the glycocalyx because they got a sugar attached to the protein, and it'll have a negative charge on there. And that's called the zeta potential, the negative charge. So two red blood cells that are normal will have negative charges. They repel each other. And it's not just the red blood cells. The white blood cells also have zeta potential. The lining of the arteries called the endothelium also has a zeta potential. Now there's things that will stick the red blood cells together. Those are called bridging molecules. Uh, fibrinogen, the clotting protein is the master of sticking together red blood cells, but elevated uric acid will also stick together red blood cells. Elevated LDL cholesterol will stick together red blood cells. IgM antibodies will stick together red blood cells. When red blood cells are stuck together, it's typically called a rouleau formation, meaning a stack of coins in French. But there's also other effects that we don't even fully understand how they happen, like from chylomicrons causing blood sludge. Okay, uh, Dr. McDougall has a great movie called Blood Sludge After High Fat Meal. It's well worth watching. You just go to YouTube. You, you, you type that in, blood sludge, high fat meal, you'll see it. Um, now, what gives the zeta potential? You have something called sialic acid, which you really think of it as a glucose with a carboxylic acid attached to it, okay? There's a little more to it than that, but you just think of a glucose with a carboxylic acid. That makes sense that it's an acid and it has a negative charge on it because you have a deprotonated carboxylic acid over here. And that gets things to repel each other. That's normal. When you've got bridging molecules in here, for whatever the reason, high fat meal, LDL cholesterol, or you've got you know increased fibrinogen because you're stressed out, the red blood cells have a tendency to stick together more. And now it's harder to push them through this capillary. So blood pressure has to go up. When the blood is thicker, increased blood viscosity, pressure has to go up to pump them through the circulatory system. Normal blood flow should be laminar. So it's sort of like a parabolic blood velocity profile. The red blood cells in the center. So I got red for red blood cells. Adjacent to them is the WBCs, the white blood cells. And then on the outer aspect is the plasma. That way the plasma is, is floating along in the, in the blood vessels adjacent to the endothelium, the lining of the artery. And that's perfect. That way you don't get things clotting and sticking when they shouldn't be. Clotting is a much bigger problem than bleeding. You know, people die all the time from clotting. Clotting in the artery of the heart is a heart attack, clotting of the artery in the brain is a stroke. So that's what you really don't want. It's a much bigger problem than bleeding. Okay, when the blood flow comes up, let's say this is the common carotid artery in the neck, and then here's the internal carotid artery going up to the brain, external carotid artery going to the face. At a branch point, there's gonna be a median divider, median divider of soft tissues. The blood's gonna hit this median divider. It's normal to have some turbulence at this site, some retrograde flow called eddy currents, but if they're excessive in amount, excessive turbulent flow, excessive retrograde eddy currents, you'll have a tendency to form a clot on the far wall away from the median divider. And this happens all over the body, very common in the coronary arteries. And the coronary arteries got tons of branch points. The common carotid artery has only one branch point, but in the heart, there's tons of little branch points. And then the clot forms on the far wall, all right? Uh, my slide got distorted here. These are supposed to be endothelial cells. They're spindle shaped and they're aligned in the direction of blood flow. And they can they have little uh, ciliate-like uh, mechanoreceptors that sense the direction of blood flow. When there's excessive turbulence or retrograde flow, they sense that as injury to the vessel. And they'll start to release more prothrombotic materials and cell surface molecules predisposing to thrombosis, okay? Um, we also talked about in my previous lecture, my last lecture on autoimmunities, I talked a lot about the effect of a high fat meal to even cause shedding of the glycocalus and this becomes more prothrombotic. Okay, so you don't want that. These endothelial cells normally under healthy conditions release a lot of nitric oxide and that's what you want. That's the good stuff. That's what Dr. Esselstyn talks about all the time. The nitric oxide is a vasodilator. 
It has an anticoagulation effect by blocking platelet uh, coagulation. It also goes through the smooth muscle cells lining the wall of the artery and causes relaxation of them. And that leads to vasodilation. So it does everything you want to do. And if you just understand nitric oxide, those three things about it, the key thing that it opens up the artery vasodilation, that's really kind of all you need to know. All this other stuff is interesting, but it's not really as important. Okay, um, here is a normal cell. And now we're gonna get into what's really happening with potassium. So I, I put all the potassium in blue. And again, that's K for calcium means potassium from the Latin. And then Na is natrium for sodium in the Latin. And you see here, the potassium is coming into the cell. This is the KNATPase. That means potassium, sodium, ATPase. And it's an ATPase because uh, uh, ATP is converted to adenosine diphosphate. Um, to make this run. So it requires energy input from the cell. And what it's doing is it's taking two potassiums in and, and booting out three sodiums. And this is going to maintain a gradient in the cell because you're pumping out three positive charges and only bringing in two positive charges. You're going to get a net effect of pumping out a charge. So you're going to end up with a, a net resting membrane potential of negative 65 millivolts. That's going to be super important. You're also going to have a large concentration of sodium outside the cell. And because the cell has a negative charge inside of it, and because it has a gradient of sodium being low inside the cell, sodium very strongly wants to get into the cell. And that's where the cell's energy comes from then to do all kinds of work at the level of the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is the outer membrane of the cell. And this is coupled to lots of things. Most importantly for our purposes, it's coupled to pumping calcium out of the cell. So this is called the NACA exchanger. NACA, N-A for NA. CA for CA for calcium exchanger. It's often abbreviated NCX. This thing is super, super fast. It can pump thousands of uh, calciums out here in a second, really fast. It's unbelievably fast. And so you need this in all your neurons because they're constantly having to um, fire action potentials, release neurotransmitters, and it all relies on this, okay? Um, here's how I abbreviate it myself for my own purposes. I call it the KC2. C is for cytoplasm. And I remember two little dots here. There's two little endpoints on the letter C. One, two, two edges come to an end there. And that's how I remember two for two um, potassium pumped into the cell. I also remember K for comes in. Okay, and I, and I think for knocks out. And I, I remember that, that the sodium is pumped out. You don't need to know all this. I'm just showing you how I do stuff. Um, when I want to remember stuff, I just make these little word associations. I play games with the letters. E is for extracellular matrix. So the sodium is being pumped into extracellular matrix. There's three endpoints on the letter E, one, two, three, as you draw it. And that's how you can remember that three sodiums are pumped out. You know, I like to have long-term mnemonics for things in case I don't come back to them for months or longer, then I can remember things long-term. Okay. All right. Here's showing another slide of like what happens in a cell. Well, when you've got increased calcium inside of a cell, it causes the glutamate neurotransmitter vesicles to fuse with the plasma membrane at the synapse and to release glutamate, the neurotransmitter, across the synaptic cleft in the brain. And then those will have an excitatory um, activation effect on the postsynaptic neuron. And this is how our memories are formed in the hippocampus, the memory center of the brain. So what am I saying? When you've got a high dietary sodium, it's going to disrupt the function of this pump. And then that's going to disrupt the function of the calcium pump. Calcium is going to accumulate in the cell and it's going to predispose you to releasing more glutamate uh, neurotransmitter than you want. And that can predispose to anxiety, insomnia, things like that. In addition, accumulation of calcium inside a smooth muscle cell in an arterial wall is going to cause that uh, muscle cell to contract. And that's what causes hypertension. Okay, so the cell has to maintain osmotic gradients and it has to maintain osmolality. Let's say this is the inside of a cell. The total amount of potassium and sodium has to be constant inside the cell. So if you eat tons of dietary sodium and not enough potassium, you're going to start accumulating sodium inside the cell and you're gonna dissipate those gradients and those pumps aren't gonna work as well. And so it's gonna always be this way. If you increase your dietary sodium, you're gonna be decreasing the amount of potassium you have in your cells. When you, and likewise, what you really want is eating a lot more potassium because that'll make things the way they should be, okay? But just need to know this. It's always going to be this way. Uh, we talked about the big secret of hypertension is keep your K factor, meaning your dietary uh, potassium much greater than your sodium. This is gonna help you too to understand when foods are good or when they're really heavily processed, when we look at some labels. All right, now I'm showing you. So that was all introductory material. 
to show you the big, this is the big picture here. This is an important slide just to understand how do cells actually function and why is all this stuff such a big deal? The vast majority of membrane pumps are gonna be this KNATPase. Like we said, taking in only two potassiums, pumping out three sodiums, and that's going to lead to a relative small amount of sodium remaining in the cell. So inside the cell, sodium level is 14. Outside the cell, it's 140, 10 times higher. And because there's a negative charge in the cell, there's all these negative charges along the plasma membrane of the cell. And you'll have positive charge extracellular matrix adjacent to the plasma membrane of the cell. Sodium really wants to get in. It's an electrical gradient because the positive charge of sodium is attracted to the negative 65 millivolts resting membrane potential of the cell. So there's an electrical gradient based on charge. There's also a concentration gradient in the sense that, you know, ions would prefer to equ equilibrate their concentration inside and outside a cell, outside and inside a cell. So because there's 10 times more sodium outside the cell, it wants to come in the cell. It wants to come into the cell to equilibrate its gradient of concentration. It wants to come into the cell because it's attracted to this negative charge. And that strong driving force of the electrochemical gradient of sodium enables it to be coupled to all kinds of things. Okay, this is primary active transport because it's dependent on ATP. The cell has to use energy to make this happen. Now, all these other things are secondary active transport, meaning that the gradient produced by this pump, and these are there's tons and tons and tons of these. Like I said, two thirds of the energy of a neuron goes to pump in this stuff. Um, the cell just uses it to do its business. It will then bring sodium in, and then it'll use that to pump out calcium. Normally, calcium is like ten thousand times higher outside the cell than inside the cell. So calcium really, really, really wants to get into the cell. Calcium is really powerful stuff. It is like flipping on a light switch. It is what makes things happen in these cells. Once you get high calcium inside the cytoplasm, in a neuron, it'll activate neurotransmitter release. We talked about that to release glutamate. The glutamate vesicle will fuse with the uh, plasma membrane of the synaptic cleft and relieve the neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft. It'll go have an effect on the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, in a smooth muscle cell of an artery, it will cause contraction of that smooth muscle cell. Um, and that's what, the, this is what the whole big deal is in hypertension. Because people are eating too much sodium, too little potassium, they're getting too much calcium accumulated in the cell because they can't pump it out because they've dissipated the gradient from these pumps because they don't have enough potassium to bring into the cell. Then what happens is the smooth muscle in the arterial lining stays contracted. And because it stays contracted, it narrows the diameter of the artery. And when you pump through a narrow uh, circuit, pressure has to go up. So that's that's the main cause of hypertension right there. So trust me, that's a major AO, academic orgasm to understand that. Because if you read all the textbooks, all the textbooks are going to tell you, even the, you know, the so-called Ivy League textbooks on cardiovascular physiology, the vast majority of hypertension is of unknown cause, typically referred to as essential hypertension. 90 to 95% of hypertension is thought to be essential in origin, thus of unknown cause. Okay. No, it's not. You look all over the world, people who eat high plant food diets with a lot of potassium, they don't hardly ever, almost never get hypertension. It'll be like around 1% or less of the population will have hypertension. It'll be for rare other reasons. Okay, so that's important to know. And also the high fat diet contributes to it. Okay, so we talked about the sodium gradient being essential for pumping out calcium. Yes, it is. But it's also essential for pumping out protons from the cell. And this gets a little bit related into the carcinogenicity of excessive dietary sodium. We're not gonna get into that today, but it's still, it's a fascinating thing that the same sodium gradient is coupled to pumping out protons from the cell, okay? It's also coupled to bringing amino acids into the cell. If you look at digestion, it can be coupled to uh, absorption of certain things, okay? So we're not gonna talk about all those other things, but what I'm trying to say is this is how cells do business. They do business by maintaining their ionic gradients, electrochemical gradients, and they do it with this pump here. And so when you eat excessive dietary sodium and not enough potassium, you mess up all these grains. You're not just causing hypertension. Hypertension is just a symptom of dissipating the K and ATPase related gradients. You're messing up cell function in numerous ways. It's a big deal. And it has a lot of other consequences. And that's why once you fix this problem, potassium comes from plants. Remember P for plants, P for potassium. You fix all kinds of other problems. Okay, this is just showing the concentration gradient differences, uh, the ions. Uh, whenever sodium goes up, potassium goes down and vice versa. Okay, a um, little more detail in here. Uh, we don't need to get into this too much. All I can tell you is eat your plant foods, you get plenty of potassium, and it'll make things go the way you want. Uh, on this thing right here, the key point is right here. If you're eating a sweet potato, for example, 
uh, you're going to have about 35 milligrams of sodium per serving, 300, over 300 uh, something of potassium. So about 10 to one. And most plant foods are going to have at least 10 to one or greater ratios. So just by eating plant foods, P for plants, P for potassium, you're going to get all the potassium you want. And trust me, that's a big deal because even if a person needs more sodium, they can compensate for it if they're eating a lot of plants. Look at this. You have almost zero milligrams per serving on one package I saw. I'll bet there's more than that most of the time, but I saw a zero on one package and a hundred of, of uh, so that's more than, let's say there was one here, a hundred to one, <laughs> the difference, the K factor there, okay? All right, now look at a processed food. Here's a processed food. This is some generic cereal. It was considered a healthy one, all right? The sodium was 330 milligrams. Potassium was zero. That was not a misprint, okay? So this is what I mean by processed foods mess up a person's physiology. You're getting tons of sodium with no potassium. This is just one serving. I remember when I was a young guy, I used to I used to have skim milk at that time, and I used to eat an entire box of cereal all the time. I would never eat less than the whole box, okay? So imagine 15 ounces of this. So 15 times 330 with next to zero potassium, okay? That's not good. All right, so what are some of the things we talked about? We talked about how more emphasizes sodium, and you hear Dr. McDougall sort of emphasize, oh, it's important to get down your dietary fat and switch to eating plant-based. But think about it, look between the lines. When you eat plant-based, you're automatically going to be increasing your potassium and lowering your sodium. So even though he doesn't emphasize the sodium potassium issue, it just happens automatically when you eat a low-fat plant-based diet. So um, just good things happen when you eat low fat plants, bad things happen when you eat, um, you know, all these meats, non-organic processed foods that are high in fat and high in sodium. Um, and, and I didn't really have enough time to get into all of it. And there's not enough time with this lecture, but I can assure you there are tons of interconnected ways that high fat diets and high sodium diets reinforce each other to make the person sicker, to cause more hypertension, to cause more increased cancer risk, to cause more insulin resistance. They sort of mutually reinforce each other. They're, they're really a major problem. They're bad. Knowing what I know after extensive study of these subjects, I definitely try to minimize my dietary sodium. Um, and like I said, Richard Moore, MD, PhD, who wrote this magnificent book, High Blood Pressure Solution, one of the top 25 all-time medical books in my experience of reading tons of them, it's a masterpiece, this book. He's an old guy retiring and he just wanted to explain his entire field. So he, it's like a legacy book and he puts it in there. It's magnificent. I actually tried to call, call the guy. I think he's dead or something. I couldn't contact him. Um, it's an absolutely brilliant book. Anyways, he says, get at least five to one, your K factor of potassium more than uh, sodium. But if you're eating a real healthy diet, you're going to have a K factor way above that. Um we don't have time to go into all this, this details of the insulin stuff. It's rather interesting, but we're not going to get time for that today. A couple other interesting points here is that when you have an ATP molecule, adenosine triphosphate, so here's the adenosine, here's the one, two, three phosphates. They got these big negative charges and this phosphate wants to break away, but it's a positive charge of magnesium that keeps these two phosphates from breaking apart. And because of that, you need magnesium for these reactions that use ATP. And that's why if you are deficient in magnesium, which is one of the most common nutrient deficiencies, most common nutrient deficiencies are being low in magnesium, being low in potassium, and being low in fiber, because they all come from plant food. And if you're low in this magnesium, you're going to have a hard time correcting your blood pressure because it, you need this to run that K and ATPase. Um, you get magnesium from eating plants. Here's a chlorophyll molecule. Right in the center of chlorophyll is magnesium. So just eat your plants, you'll get your magnesium. Okay, some things about reading food labels. Yeah, what I, like I showed you on that processed cereal, look at the sodium and the potassium. Unfortunately, a lot of things don't include the potassium, but when you see high sodium and a low potassium, that almost always indicates it's a highly processed food and I would not eat it. I don't eat any processed food. The only processed food I'll eat would be, you know, single ingredient, plain oatmeal. Um, less processed, the better. Uh, let's see here. Also, I like, I like potatoes, sweet potatoes and rice. They're all super low in fat, like 1% fat. Uh, potatoes, I hear it here, this, the potassium was 620 milligrams per serving and the sodium is zero. Look at that. You see that? Okay, let's imagine it was one. You would have a K factor with potatoes of about, according to this line right here, about 620. <laughs> um, in general, the more processed the food, the lower the potassium and the higher the sodium. And that's going to have interesting consequences when we talk about some real life situations. Okay, stress makes things worse. Cortisol causes retention of sodium. 
Um, catecholamines also increase blood pressure. Sleep deprivation and caffeine are analogous to stress due to raise the same hormones. So how do you prevent hypertension? Minimize your dietary sodium. Uh, we talked about ways to do that. Some people will switch to the potassium chloride uh, salt solution, and they had big success with that in Finland. Um, and that's a pretty famous thing in Finland from like 1970 to 2000. They dramatically improved the health of the population by decreasing their dietary salt or dietary fat and using some of these salt substitutes. Um, in general, I think you really should try to keep your dietary fat below 10%, which is, you would say, a very low-fat diet. That's relevant. The reason I call it very low-fat diet and, is that a lot of these studies will call 30% fat low-fat, which I would consider high-fat, but just in the studies, they'll call it. So I'd call it very low-fat, less than 10%. If you follow McDougal diet, Chef AJ diet, Esselstyn diet, Kempner diet, Pritikin diet, Rogers, Spartan vegan diet, you're going to be eating 10% or less of fat, or at least close to that at the most, like 12%. And that's what you want. You want a low dietary fat. And just by eating plant foods, you're going to be cranking up your potassium intake and minimizing your sodium intake. Dr. McDougal says, ah, let them have a little bit of salt on their food so it tastes better. Otherwise, they won't eat it. The most important thing is eat the plant foods and avoid the animal foods and the oils. Okay. And he's still getting a lot of ton of potassium because they're eating all the plant foods. Okay. Optimize your weight. Avoid canned foods are going to tend to have a lot of sodium. You know, they're convenient for storage, but they often have a lot of sodium in them. Processed foods tend to have tons of sodium. Um, watch out for some of these medications. Exercise improves your health. All those things help prevent hypertension. And one of the biggest dangers of hypertension is I think hypertension very commonly leads to dementia. And the reason I say that is I think there's a tendency to overtreat hypertension. And when you overtreat hypertension, you can cause chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, meaning that on a chronic basis, not getting enough blood to the brain. And this comes from the work of Jack Della Torre. He did research in mice where he would tie off the carotid artery in the neck of the mouse. And typically the mouse would become demented about two months later. And when he did an autopsy on the mouse's brain, instead of finding a big stroke on the side where they tied off the carotid, they would just find the brain was atrophic, would be the typical thing they'd find. So that's consistent with lack of blood flow over time, leading to the neurons dying slowly where they recycle themselves. That's called apoptosis. That's in comparison with a sudden death of a neuron due to complete occlusion of a large artery. That would be called a stroke where you get necrosis, a big mess, the cell plasma membrane lysis. And then there's a big cleanup process through the microglia um, immune system cells. And that's a stroke. You can see it on an MRI immediately. And it's obvious where the problem is. Whereas apoptosis is a gradual, slow process of neurons recycling themselves. And you just see the brain shrinking. You don't see anything. This is by far more common. I see, I would tell you the vast majority of brains I see, I just see a shrunken brain, apoptosis. Okay. And so what do I think contributes to that quite often? I think overtreatment hypertension. Okay. Because you get chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, a daily, you know, why is the blood pressure high in the first place? Because it's so thick from all the blood and vasoconstrictor from all the sodium that the pressure has to go up to get adequate blood supply to the brain. Okay, the brain is sort of the thing that controls the whole body. So watch out for overtreating hypertension. Um, other mouse equivalents, you know, things that are going to cause chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation can in large part be due to ischemia of the cardiac muscle. And as it becomes damaged from the chronic ischemia, lack of blood flow, uh, you can get abnormal conduction. And that can lead to things like atrial fibrillation. With atrial fibrillation, you lose the the atrial kick, if you will. That's called a component of atrial filling that contributes to ventricular filling so that you get more blood in the ventricle before it contracts, more stroke volume, more blood pushed out of the ventricle with each contraction, and that's needed to maintain adequate blood supply to the brain. So chronic AFib can lead to chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. I call these mouse equivalents. If you like the mouse, it can lead to dementia. Congestive heart failure, a weak heart under pumping blood to the brain can cause dementia. Same, same sequela, so cerebral hypoperfusion, apoptosis, dementia. Um, obstructive sleep apnea, like typically an obese person, they can be hypoxic at night. We now know that from checking a pulse ox on their fingertip that they're dropping their oxygen delivery to the brain uh, repeatedly through the night. Diabetes, we talked about this in a previous lecture on dementia and diabetes, how that will cause uh, decreased oxygen availability to brain neurons. And that can also predispose them to develop apoptosis. Very common talking to diabetics that they're cognitively impaired. And I have internal medicine friends that told me almost all of their patients over the age of 60 are cognitively impaired. It's very common. Um, and that's the thing I've seen a dramatic increase in cognitively impaired people uh, uh, through the years compared to like what I remember in my early days of starting out in medicine. Overtreated hypertension, we talked about that. Carotid stenosis, narrowing of the artery there. You know, people with hypertension is super common. Carotid stenosis is not that common compared to hypertension, but it still happens often enough. Aortic stenosis, aortic regurg can lead to 
decreased amount of blood pumped up to the brain, post-cabbage hypotension, like my dad had open heart surgery many years ago before I knew better and I couldn't talk him into it. I knew about Ornish, but I didn't know about Essendine yet at that time. It was many, many years ago. And my dad went ahead and had a cabbage and he did well with his cabbage, but I was scared in the post-op phase. They ran him real hypotensive, 85 to 90 over, I think like 65 or something. And I asked the anesthesiologist why you're running his pressure so low. And he's like, oh, well, I don't want him to bleed out. It is an anastomosis, a site where they connect the grafts in, uh, to, the, to the coronary arteries in the chest. And because of that, he ran him low. My dad did fine with it all, but I thought to myself, well, gee, my dad was a pretty healthy guy compared to most cabbage patients. I thought if somebody else has got, you know, atherosclerosis up in their brain or up in their carotids in their neck, they might, you know, get a uh, apoptosis and brain neurons from that. Uh, severe anemia can cause problems. Things that increase demand of the neuron are going to require it to have more oxygen glucose delivery. And if it can't meet those demands, then those neurons are predisposed to apoptosis. That'll be things like caffeine, for example. Stress does the same and these other things. Okay, so here's an interesting topic. Hypertension in Blacks, African-Americans, all right? Hypertension is super common in that population. And I had learned when I was a medical student resident, oh, there's nothing you could do about it. You know, it might be genetic due to salt sensitivity. You know, I didn't know any better. I'm like, okay, you know, tons and tons of uh, persons get kidney failure from this. And here it is, the risk, uh, relative risk of stroke three times increased, very high risk of kidney failure. Um, and so here's Richard Moore's take on it. He says the main reason for hypertension in African Americans is not not excessive dietary sodium. That's an important point. He says it's not primarily excessive sodium intake. He says it's because their potassium intake is so low. And so the way I see this is that's tremendous news. That's a totally fixable problem. A person can easily increase their potassium intake. And then you say, well, how can you be sure? How do you know it's not genetic? Well, um, in 1929, this is a study in the Lancet Journal. Here's the author, Donison. Okay, blood pressure. Here's what they found. They had 1,800 patients admitted to a hospital and they checked all their blood pressure. No case of raised blood pressure was encountered. No hypertension. 1,800 patients in a row, none of them had hypertension. <laughs> okay. They're eating a plant based diet in Kenya. Okay. So it's, they're fine. When they eat a plant based diet, they don't got hypertension. Okay. And then there's other populations we talked about, like the Yanomama. This is a pretty good paper. Salt. Hyper, salt and hypertension, evolutionary perspective. So what I'm basically saying is the African-Americans in the United States, they tend to eat a very, very, very low potassium because they don't eat enough plant food. If they ate more plant foods, their potassium would go up and that would help them to have much better control of their blood pressure. That is a very fixable thing. So that's great news. Eat more plants. And I would also lower dietary sodium, but that's, that's something that can be improved. That situation can be dramatically improved. Uh, by the way, here's the lining of an of a artery. Um, Let's see, you got little tight junctions between the endothelial cells that line the artery. Oh, this is actually the blood-brain barrier. Those are the pericytes. Um, here's the endothelial cells lining an artery. This would be the blood flow passing through here. Tight junctions between these adjacent endothelial cells. Pericytes, just call them supporting cells for the blood-brain barrier junction. Um, I really want to show you this picture here. So here's where the red blood cells enter a capillary. And as they pass, this is in the brain, but it could be anywhere in the body for our purposes at this time. The red blood cells pass down the capillary. You can see how they deform a little bit. Then they release oxygen. And this is a normal capillary up here at top. The oxygen passes through the uh, endothelial cells are these spindle-shaped cells. That's a nucleus of the spindle-shaped endothelial cell. Then they have this basement membrane, which is in yellow. And the oxygen will pass through that. It'll pass through the muscles in that area, the vascular smooth muscles. There's not that many of them along the capillary, but... Uh, the blue oxygen then goes to, for example, a neuron supplies the tissue. All right, so here's the point. Chronic diabetes is going to cause thickening of this capillary basement membrane. Chronic hypertension is going to cause thickening of the vascular smooth muscle. Well, when that happens, less oxygen is able to get through to the tissue. So you increase the risk, the risk of the tissue being hypoxic. As well with chronic hypertension, you're not only going to have more muscles, you get muscle bound arterioles, there's also going to be more scar tissue, more collagen. And that's going to be, it's also called fibrosis. This becomes progressively thickened and scarred and eventually calcified. All of these things are going to decrease the function of those arteries, arterioles, and capillaries and make it harder to get adequate oxygen delivery to the tissues, predisposing to lose brain cells, neurons. Okay. Neurons need tons and tons of oxygen to make tons and tons of ATP for all these uh, potassium sodium ATP pumps. 65% of the energy goes to that. It's very energy dependent. These are just a couple of papers showing how you need to um, 
uh, how, how the, the, the capillary and arterial walls are thickened by hypertension and diabetes, um, and on how this eventually leads to cognitive decline. Uh, more papers, just all supporting thing. I put the papers in there for the people who want to look up stuff. So I, I want you to be able to look this up on your own if you're curious about it. Here was the Kempner diet. Look at this. He had only 2% dietary fat and he had dramatically lowered sodium. And he has like the best hypertension treatment results in the history of the world um, with his rice diet and fruits. Tata Humata, you know, eating their old plant-based diet, lots of corn, some bean squash. Um, they had no problems with blood pressure, no obesity. In comparison with the Pima absorbed in the United States after 1848 Mexican-American War, they were absorbed in Arizona. The Pima and the Tara Humara were together in what we would call Northern Mexico these days. They kept their old ways. They're still in Northern Mexico by Sierra Madre Mountains, Copper Canyon and whatnot. Pima absorbed in Arizona, eating a standard American diet, the SAD diet, tons of obesity, all the same westernized diets as other persons who eat that way get. These guys are world famous ultra marathoners. They can run over hundred miles in two days. Every guy in town, not just a fast guy. Yanomamo up here in the Amazon jungle at the junction of Venezuela and Brazil, same thing. They only eat about 200 milligrams a day of sodium. They don't have any problems with high blood pressure. They got the same blood pressure and they're elderly as they do when they're teenagers. And that's pretty common finding. If you don't add salt to the, the diet, you eat a plant-based diet, you don't get high blood pressure. We talked about Kenya uh, having good blood pressures when they, you know, ate their traditional plant-based diets. They're also fantastic long distance runners. The world marathon holder about two hours is like Kipchoge. Um, atherosclerosis, partly reversible. Okay, we're not really focusing on that today, but it is. Um, we talked about endothelial injury. What makes blood thick? Anything that makes blood thick is gonna predispose to atherosclerosis and hypertension. So there's a whole bunch of things that do it, but the main things that we talked about was the high dietary fat, and that leads to diabetes. Um, then we talked about the sodium being primarily a vasoconstrictor for our purposes. It also leads to a little bit of increased insulin resistance. Oh, percent fat here. This is interesting. Look at this. White rice, potato, sweet potato, 1% fat. That's why I think those are three of the best foods in the world. I actually think the best food in the whole world, the healthiest food in the whole world is sweet potatoes. It's only got about four and a half percent protein. So you want low protein and you want low fat. There it is. Sweet potato is, and it tastes great. Apples and blueberries are also very low in fat. Um, garbanzo beans got about 13% fat, but I still eat garbanzo beans and I'll still eat oatmeal. It's about 15% fat. Uh, a lot of these other things, I would avoid them for their higher amounts of fat. <clears throat> uh, vision diseases are largely vascular diseases. Each one's a little different. Cataract, diabetic retinopathy, age-related macular degeneration. These are the most common causes of blindness here in adults, hypertensive retinopathy, glaucoma, they're all vascular diseases. You know, glaucoma is a little more associated with hypertension. Of course, hypertensive retinopathy, um, Cataracts, a little bit more associated with dairy, for example, diabetic with diabetic, of course. But what I'm saying is they're all vascular diseases. If you avoid the atherosclerosis risk factors and hypertension risk factors, you have a dramatically better chance of avoiding all these diseases. Um, Kempner would show patients who had reversal of significant diabetic hypertensive retinopathy on his follow-ups, incredible results. Um, so I don't wanna go into all the details. Oh, the one thing was I noticed a lot of my cerebral amyloid angiopathy patients just like what happens in the brain, it happens in the eye to a large extent. And the same patients would have increased incidence of ocular hemorrhages. I had noticed that when I was looking at brains. Um, and I also had noticed that the cerebral amyloid angiopathy brains were very much like the hypertensive brains. We're not going to get into all that. I talk about that in my dementia lectures, but that's an interesting observation. So what I'm trying to say is what I alluded to earlier, that a lot of these diseases are all the same thing. You can call it cerebral amyloid angiopathy, but it certainly seems very much to me like hypertension, which seems like hypertensive uh, retinopathy. Um, so, and the, the significance of these diseases being related means that if you prevent one of them, you're probably going to prevent the other ones that are related to it. You got a very good chance to do that. And the eye, a lot of stuff about the brain is figured out from looking at the eye, because you can see into the eye a lot better than you can see into the brain. You can look at it directly. So anyways, um, that pretty much sums up the slides I have for today. It's a beautiful painting here, moonlit night on Capri. So, uh, happy holidays and good luck to everybody. And I hope that was helpful to you. You put so much into your presentations. Is it okay if I stop screen share right now? Yeah, yeah. That's all my slides. That's great. Well, people are asking like, well, what do we use for toothpaste? But you're, it sounds like you don't use anything for toothpaste. Yeah, I. what I consider the key thing is your saliva is going to go down at night. So I try to make sure I always use those little interdental brushes and I floss. You know, little interdental, you buy a hundred of them at a time. You just put them between your teeth. They're made out of plastic. Um, I, like I, love, those. I love those because you can do them while you're driving and they're, they're so convenient. 
Oh yeah, there's another trick to watch out with, with dental floss. You don't want to get the ones with Teflon in them. So I get the plain one, unwaxed with nothing added to it. And it might be a little more prone to breaking the string. It doesn't go through quite as easy, but you avoid the Teflon. The Teflon is going to put fluoride into your mouth. And not only that, the fluoride, it also inhibits nitric oxide conversion in the back of the tongue, those bacteria. Um, so you're going to, you, you, you're, you know, that was the thing that I think his name is Nathan Bryant was the guy, the expert on nitric oxide. So yeah. you're going to be decreasing that. So you're going to be, you're, it's, it's actually atherogenic to be using that stuff for any type of real powerful chemicals on your teeth. Why would I even brush my teeth with a plain brush sometimes to get the uh, like biofilms off bacteria can survive inside of those. And at the end of the meal, I typically rinse my mouth with a little bit of water to get the food out of there. Um, I only eat, I typically have been eating the OMAD diet on my, on my work days. Cause it's convenient. One meal a day diet. On my days off, I'll typically eat a late lunch and then a little bit of a late dinner. And, uh, it's sort of natural to eat twice in that setting. It's like a, a break. But um, I'm curious, Dr. Rogers, because it, it seems to me like eating, do you, do, how do you get enough calories in one meal? It seems like you would really have to stuff yourself. Well, I'll, if, 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 I, if I'm walking, a lot of times I'll walk around while I eat. I have a big bowl. I, my family calls it the Shrek bowl. And I'll have a bunch of rice in there and potatoes and beans all mixed together. It tastes very good. And I actually like to walk around while I eat if, if I'm not doing anything. A lot of times too, I'll watch internet videos. But sometimes let's say I've been working all morning on, on a paper or preparing to talk. Then I'll, I'll, I'll take a lunch break and I'll just walk in circles around the house as long as people don't kick me out of the different rooms because I'm annoying them. But um, I get a lot of exercise from that. And, um, and it's good stuff. And you can eat anything out of a bowl like that. Sweet potatoes. You can eat blueberries and salads. Do you basically eat your food rather plain or do, do, do you cook it yourself? I'm really simple. I'm like so simple. It's not even funny. Yeah. I, I eat stuff, just plain blueberries, plain salad. And then the only thing I use for cooking is just, I boil stuff. I boil rice, potatoes, sweet potatoes. And uh, I kind of joke, I have like a mother-in-law, you know, and uh, she don't like me in the kitchen. As soon as I walk in the kitchen, I'm doing something wrong. You're wasting electricity. If I turn the light on, you're wasting water. If I turn the faucet on, and I jokingly, I have a nickname for her. I call her Rumpelstiltskin because Rumpelstiltskin was really grouchy and kind of kind of mean. But, but if you just leave him alone, he would turn the hay into gold. OK, so I'm like, OK, grandma. All right. I'll stay out of the kitchen while she's in there. But man, she makes great food for me. So I'm very grateful to her. Ma ma lower your camera a little because you're, you're getting cut. I just, you're getting cut off oh, just a little bit. That yeah, better? That, that's better. Thank you so much. Right. So on the right. days that you do one meal a day, is it is it dinner? Yeah, I do it as dinner because I have to work during the day and it's kind of convenient. And then you'd ask yourself the question, well, what do I do on a day off? Well, we're most intelligent in the morning. So a lot of times I'm trying to do something intellectually challenging in the morning. So I always immediately sit down and start working. As soon as I wake up, I go right to work on whatever I'm trying to do intellectually. Um, and then I don't want to eat because as soon as you eat that lunch, your IQ drops about 30 points. You know, you want to take a nap. And you no longer can concentrate well and integrate all the material. So I'll typically eat a late lunch and I'll do it almost as a study break too, because, because, and that's the thing I laugh. A lot of people talk about, oh, I can't concentrate. I can't focus. Well, I think if you get your priorities correct, it becomes a lot easier to focus. My problem is the opposite. I, I, I keep on wanting to study something and understand it. And I can't get out of my chair. For, and I got to, I got to get out of my chair, you know, because otherwise I'm not going to get any exercise, not healthy to sit for hours on end. So what I'm saying is I look forward to the meal as an opportunity to exercise because I'm, when I'm on my days off, I'll walk around during that late lunch and get a lot of exercise with the lunch from walking around in circles, eating and walking around while I enter dental, brush my teeth, walking around while I floss my teeth. That ends up being a lot of walking. Um, and if there's some sunny, if it's a sunny day, I go out and stand in the driveway and get some sunshine walking the driveway. So um, your, your family like doesn't do mind, it. your family doesn't mind that you don't share meals with them. Like for example, today's Easter, it's a big celebration for a lot of people. Well, everybody's kind of got different schedules. And I think that's a little bit unfortunate in the modern world. Families don't eat together as much as they should, but you know, you do what you can. I try to be helpful and all that when I can. Oh, that's, you, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, I, I eat only two meals a day because I'm just not hungry enough for three, but I, I, if I only ate one, it would have to, wouldn't have to be twice as many calories. I can't imagine just have, getting everything I need, which is about 1700 calories in just one meal. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know. It's kind of easy for me because I just, I do a lot of little tricks myself too. Like let's say I'm eating blueberries. I only eat one pack at a time. Let's say 10 ounce pack because that forces me to walk a bunch of stairs. The way my house is set up, I have to walk a whole bunch of stairs between all my different activities. And that's good. As a matter of fact, that was a victory I had over the wife. We had to agree on what bathroom are you going to use? Because we each wanted our own bathroom. And she's like, oh, I get the bathroom in the parents' bedroom. I'm like, okay, fine. 
you know, and I acted like I was disappointed, but it was a victory because I have to constantly walk all the way up and down all these stairs. I get tons of exercise and that's good for me. Um, and I like, let's say I'm, I'm studying in one room in order for me to go to the bathroom. I have to walk up a bunch of stairs to go to the other bathroom. And that's, so what I'm trying to say is I do all kinds of little tricks intentionally as well to make myself exercise more. I'll always use a, wherever I am, I'll use a far bathroom if I can. So I get more walking wherever I am. I'll try to walk more stairs. And that ends up being a lot of exercise. I'll do many, many flights of stairs every day. Um, so things like that. Have you always eaten this way? Because I'm not really sure about the part of your story when you, I, I remember seeing you as a star McDougal or you were much heavier, but at what point did you adopt a plant-based diet? And when did you start doing basically one meal a day? Well, I went vegetarian, I think about 20 years ago, but I didn't go 100% vegan until about four years ago. Um, and sort of like the more you study it, the more you just sort of end up 100% vegan, okay? Because you just see you have nothing to gain by eating the meats and the oils, but you have a lot to gain by going 100% vegan. It just You just end up in that direction. Um, but the reason I time my meals the way I do is I eat the one meal a day diet when I'm working just because I don't want to eat a breakfast so that way I can sleep more. And if I eat, if I get all my calories in one meal, I get the process over with faster so I got more time to sleep and do other things. Um, and, you know, I'm busy on a work day. On a non-work day, my focus tends to be doing something intellectual. In the morning, I'm either making a video, preparing a talk, writing a book chapter. I'm usually doing something like that. So I want to be as smart as possible. And that means getting right to work as soon as you wake up. That's a key thing, I think, for students, too. If you want to be a good student, as soon as you wake up, get to work. Because, um, you know, that morning is precious brain time. Your, your brain has cleaned itself overnight through the glymphatic system. And I know, like I said, too, as soon as I eat lunch, IQ drops. So... Um, usually I'll need a study break in the afternoon. So when it's time for that study break, then I'll walk around, get lots of walking with the lunch and I'll eat a lunch and I'll eat especially like hydrating foods for that meal. Like, let's say I was going to eat oatmeal. I'd rather eat oatmeal for lunch than for dinner. Cause if you eat oatmeal for dinner, you're gonna have to wake up at night to void. So I'll walk around and eat a nice lunch and then I'll go back and do some easier work. And then I'll eat a late dinner at night. A lot of times I'll work out sometimes. Like I, I lift weights on the weekends. You know, that sort of thing. That's interesting that you say you're smarter in the morning. That's why it was no problem for you to change your showtime here from 11 a.m. to 8 a.m. Because now you're going to be even smarter. Yeah, I think that's the key thing, because basically, when does an animal need to be smart? When it's hungry. So overnight, we fasted in the morning. So we get ghrelin is released from our stomach, goes up to our hippocampus, and it increases our attention. You get a little burst of cortisol, not too much, but just enough to energize you. And yeah, and you could focus. Plus, the, the neurons can't go offline in the daytime because they have to maintain their neuronal gradients. They go offline at night and they, they flush out all their waste products and they're rinsed away by the cerebral spinal fluid. That's called the glymphatic system. So when you wake up, man, your neurons are primed and that's when you can do your most challenging stuff. Before you changed your diet, was it, was it, was it a, a, a very unhealthy diet or just, just one that included animals? It was pretty healthy. I was lucky because my mother's sister was like a PhD in nutrition. So when we were kids growing up, my mom would always leave on the table in the kitchen a bunch of things like cucumbers and apples and carrots. So we ate pretty healthy. She also would make rice and beans all the time, but she would often have chicken in it when we were growing up as kids, but it was still relatively health healthy. Um, and so I think we were all pretty strong and robust. My brothers and myself, we were all strong, good athletes and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I, I had that, I had that being okay. I remember I got my cholesterol check when I was in med school, it was 185. So nowadays it varies between about 90 to 120, but that's what it was in med school when I used to eat the old way. So it wasn't too bad, but I did, I did sometimes eat processed food and stuff. And, you know, I didn't know any better. Yeah. Have you ever fasted like water fasting? Um, I have not tried that, but I can see ways where that could be helpful. Interesting. Thank you. It's fun, fun to find out about you. Well, if you're, if you'd like, we've got some questions, both that have been submitted in the, in advance and in the chat, they're not necessarily all on fluoride or toxicology, but would you, do you have some time to answer a few? Sure. Right. Uh, the first one I'm seeing in the chat, uh, the viewer says, Pritikin spoke about intentionally creating collateral blood flow via exercise. What does Dr. Rogers rhino maybe he says think about the body's ability to develop collateral blood flow can the brain do it um i think it can because normally the body and the brain are working together and when you have a chronic increased demand for oxygen the body will produce increased capillaries that's called angiogenesis and when a person exercises they do produce new neurons that's called neurogenesis they found this out in mice 
you know, they run them on a treadmill and they'll produce new blood vessels in their brain and they'll produce new neurons in their brain, neurogenesis and androgenesis. And I think that's a big part of why exercise is so helpful to the brain. Because normally, you know, we're trying to coordinate our experience of, let's say, walking through a forest, you know, and they have to go together, the muscle activity and the, uh, the brain activity, the formation of new neurons. So what I'm also saying here, just like you store increased glycogen in the muscle with exercise, you will also do the same thing in the brain. It'll be stored in the astrocytes, which are like the helper cells to the neurons, but it's all happening. So exercise makes you smarter. And yes, it can increase collateral blood flow. Terrific. Uh, here's a comment um, that says, I, I, I'm not familiar with this, but you can tell me what you think. Uh, Christian says he heard the Nazis experimented with fluoride. Yeah, I don't know all that much about it, but what I can say is it's not a healthy thing. Okay. It's, it's when you start reading about it, you, you find yourself surprised. It's not just bad. It's like real bad. So then, then what happens is you've got like the American dental, they've committed themselves to saying it's good. So they, they feel like there'll be a legal consequence if they change their position. So they're just going to emphasize the studies that show the benefits of it. But I think if you look at it from a more holistic perspective, you're not going to think it's a good idea. I wonder if there are dentists out there that know the truth about this. There are some, and there's different names for some of these dentists. I think they maybe call themselves like biologic dentists. And there are two sort of big concerns in dentistry that I'm aware of. Well, there's three of them I'm aware of. Number one is this uh, F minus stuff. Number two would be the issues with root canals. And number three would be the issues with amalgams. You know, they call them silver fillings, but they actually have a lot of mercury in them. And then there's thoughts about how much do they outgas. And for example, that's another reason why I don't ever want to brush teeth because I have some of those amalgams. You don't ever want to brush teeth over them, uh, run a brush over them because you're potentially releasing more mercury from them. That's my thought on there. And if you've got fluoridated toothpaste, that causes increased mercury release. And some people think that that can contribute over time to cognitive impairment. You know, I don't know for sure how much that happens, but I don't want to, if it's something I can easily avoid, I avoid it. All right. Well, Maria is saying, but fluoride and toothpaste has been shown to be extremely beneficial in preventing and reversing incipient cavities. And it's much worse to have to get a filling. What do you think about that? Well, I can tell you, I haven't been to a dentist in over 25 years. I had an experience many, many years ago where I was in the dental chair and they're using the slow drill and I didn't like it. And I'm like, man, I don't like this. I don't want to go back to the dentist. So I read a whole bunch of books and stuff on dentistry and stuff. And if you just avoid acidic foods like soda pop, orange juice is very acidic. Um, you are very unlikely to form cavities. And then also I rinse my mouth off of water at the end of the meal. I don't eat any sweets. Look at soda pop. It's not only acidic, it's also very sweet. And it's also real sticky. Like you spill soda pop on something and stay sticky. That's what it does to your teeth. So I avoid all those foods. And also look at the work of Weston Price. I mean, I disagree with them, of course, on the meat and the high fat foods, but the Weston Price was a dentist in the 1920s and 1930s, traveled all over the world. Populations eating sort of indigenous traditional diets. They didn't have any problems with tooth decay, primarily a dietary thing. So um, I cleaned my teeth off afterwards with interdental brushes. I always floss at night. Um, I don't have any problems with my teeth and they feel good. And also, we went with another couple where my, my wife and I with this other couple where one of the persons was a dentist and he looked at my mouth for free. And they told me my teeth are great. They go, you will die with those teeth. And I'm like, okay, thank you. So I, my teeth are fine. They feel great. I have no problems with them. And just because I take care of them. And, and that's a sort of a general theme. If you take care of body parts, your your teeth, your arteries, you're unlikely to develop a problem. And it's a, it's a good way to go. It's cheap. It's convenient. It works. Yeah. I'm assuming even the days that you eat only one meal, you're hydrating throughout the day, you're drinking water. Well, I don't. Uh, I get a lot of water from the plant foods. I eat. There's tons of water in rice and potatoes um, and in blueberries and, and in salads. And I eat a lot of those. So it ends up not being an issue for me. And for example, what I think is a little bit of a pitfall is if you're drinking, you know, water that's got aluminum in it, excuse me, an F minus, that's not going to be good for your health. Plus tap water, it's too expensive to remove all the estrogenic chemicals. So it's like a toxic brew. I don't think it's healthy. I so you don't drink any water because people are asking, what kind of water do you drink? Do you drink Brita? Okay, you well, that, that's actually an interesting question. And here's my way of take on that. If you look at the marathon runners back in the 1960s, early 70s, and this includes like world champions, they didn't drink any water when they run a 26 mile race. Our body can compensate for significant water loss in the short term. Okay. So you don't have to be drinking all the water all the time. I was a wrestler in college. We sweat off five or 10 pounds every practice. We didn't drink any water until after practice. Okay. So that's why to me, it's kind of a joke. You go to health club, everybody's sipping on their bottle of water every five seconds. You know, they're barely breaking a sweat. Okay. So 
what am I saying is I think you get plenty from eating these plant foods. Um, and then the bottled waters, a lot of them are in a PETE bottle, you know, polyethylene terephthalate, and that's a phthalate. That's an estrogenic chemical. Um, some of the aluminum chemists recommend you drink silicated water with silicone in it. And they say that that helps to chelate aluminum out of the body and lowers your risk of dementia. So if I had to, I would probably drink that. But I also recall that no one talked about bottled water until they or drinking eight cups a day until they started selling the stuff like in the late 1980s. When I was a young guy, I never heard anybody say this eight cups a day stuff. And also ask yourself, you know, you got a 350 pound football player lineman. Does he need eight cups a day? And then an 80 pound woman needs eight cups a day too? No, it depends on your body size. It depends on your thirst. And I would say it also depends on eating healthy water. Plus you run into what I call the water paradox. For example, the water I do drink when I drink water, I only drink small amounts. It would be reverse osmosis water from my kitchen. If you look at the reverse osmosis, the way you can check is there's something called TDS, total dissolved solids. It looks like about a, like a pen. You can buy them for like around $20. That's the number of particles, let's say per square uh, centimeter. And if you have tap water, it's in the ballpark of around 500. If you've got carbon filter water, it's in the ballpark about a TDS of around 200. Your blood, by the way, osmolality is about 300. And it's not the exact same as TDS, but for our purposes, they're good enough uh, to compare them in that way. So if you, you can just drink carbon filter water straight, carbon filter tap water straight and not have an osmolality issue. Some people are sensitive to osmolality. Other people are not. Um, you can eat first to get more particles, if you will, into your stomach, into your blood. So that's an osmolality issue. Um, but all I can say is it hasn't been a problem for me. I know people will tell you if you hydrate well, you're going to be, you're going to feel better. And I think there's some truth to that. I actually have a trick here. You want to hold on one second and get something a little funny for you? Yeah, absolutely. Give me one second. Sure. I'll, I'll be right back. All right. Take your time. Hi guys. Hey, ha ha Ollie's getting that. I'll just talk to you for a moment. Happy Easter. Thank you for watching. I hope you're enjoying Dr. Rogers. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, I'd really appreciate it because I'm getting close to 200,000 and I think they give me a plaque or something. I was supposed to get it at 100,000, but I didn't. So please consider subscribing and please consider subscribing to chefha.com because it makes it easier for us to archive any questions you have for the doctors. Welcome back, Dr. Rogers. Okay, I'm gonna show you like my trick. What do I use before I give a presentation? I'm not gonna show you the brand or anything. You don't need to know that, but this is beet juice. So like before I'm going to give a talk, it takes, this increases your nitric oxide with the nitrates are precursors. And it's been shown in bicycle riders, trying trials, they, they, they perform better with some beet juice on board. So let's say I'm going to give a talk. I'll guzzle down 32 ounces of this stuff and I'll chase it with 16 ounces of water. I've given tons of talks in my life and I know what works. It just, I think it optimizes your blood glucose levels for about four hours or so. And I do this before I lift weights, but I'm going for my personal records with squatting or something. And it gives me maximum energy. I just know it works. So I'm saying if a person wants to optimize their proportion, they have to give a presentation at their job or whatever for teaching. And it's in a big thing for them. This maximizes your exercise intensity. I know because I, I do high rep squats. Like I did a set of 115 pounds for 115 reps with my last squat. And it takes some energy. And I know this helps. I, I've, I've done it with and without. And I've given tons of talks with and without. It works. So you simultaneously are hydrating and optimizing blood glucose. What do you do for exercise? And do you, are you able to exercise? Because I imagine you probably have to be at the hospital pretty early five days a week. Yeah, I only I only squat once a week. And the reason I squat, I do high repetition squats with a safety squat bar, because to me, that reminds me of like wrestling. And it's a type of strength that I like. Like if you look at a young guy, a lot of young guys, they want to talk, how strong are you for a one rep maximum? How much can you bench press or squat or deadlift? Okay, fine. But an old guy, you know me, I want to be strong like a farmer, you know, throwing around 50 pound bales of hay all day, able to, to do that with relative ease. And I like that wrestler strength. So, so it was more of an endurance component, more of an aerobic component. And so what I'm saying is I do high repetition squats. Now, when most people talk about a high rep set, they're going to talk about, you know, 10 reps, 15 or 20 reps. There was a guy by the name of Tom Platts. He was a world champion uh, Olympian for uh, bodybuilding and squats. And he would do sets of like 50 repetitions. And so I got in the habit of, I found 50 was almost too easy for me. So I'll do sets of, I gradually work my way up to hundred. I don't do hundred every, every weekend, but I'll drop back down. I'll go up five pounds in weight and then I'll do 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, then get to 100, 125 reps with the weight. My last squat, just to give you a, like a sense of the type of weights I'm talking about, I did 115 pounds for 115 reps and I go very fast because in order to do that, you got to have pretty good endurance. So I'm not trying to get a high single rep maximum. I like just having the type of fitness. I can very easily walk up 50 flights of stairs. You know, um, I got good cardiovascular fitness. I know that because sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do things with other people. And I usually have way more endurance than they do. 
Um, you know, even, even a lot of young guys, um, if I have to walk upstairs with them, you know, so for what it's worth that, that's kind of how I do it. And I always try to force myself to exercise. Like I'll park far in a parking lot. I'll always make myself take stairs and I'm constantly going up and down stairs all day long. Uh, when on my days off and I go off, I go on quite a bit. I have to, you know, in, in my work environment as well. So I get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of exercise built into my day. I wish I had more time. I gosh, if I could do my life over again, I would have tried to work at a place where there was a wrestling program nearby. I would have loved to coach wrestling. I coached college wrestling for two years when I was in med school. Um, and I really wish I had done more of it because it's a lot of fun. You know, it's kind of fun. Young people, they kind of got like this enthusiasm, young wrestlers. And I, I had Dave Schultz was my coach. He's like the best technical wrestler in the world. So I learned a lot of technique, but I learned from Mark Schultz. Mark Schultz was like the best psychological guy. And so I had a lot to teach and I enjoyed it. So, you know, in life you screw up, you know, and you do the best you can. Nice. Uh, does anyone in your family follow any of your healthy lifestyle advice, either with diet or exercise? They're kind of going that way. What I saw happen to my kids, for example, you know, there was kind of an attitude in my house. Oh, I'm just autistic, crazy person. No, I know what I'm talking about. Okay. And so the older the kids got, the more they're like, oh yeah, dad was right about that. Oh yeah. Gee, gee, dad was right about that too. Yeah. Right. Okay. So like, you know, my son was like drinking all this milk. He wants to big, be a big, strong weightlifter. Right. And I said, do you realize that cow is pregnant and that milk is full of estrogen? He's like, oh my God. And now uh, there's things like that come up. Plus also I see the geniuses lifting weights and they got their cell phones in their front pocket. And I'm like, you know, do you realize you're, you're microwaving your balls there, genius? Okay, that's not gonna help you become stronger. There's a lot of things like that come up. So initially what happens is they'll see some big muscle bound weightlifter on the internet and he's gonna tell them, okay guys, here's what you gotta do to get big and strong take my protein supplement. But it's a lie because the guy got big and strong because he's taking anabolic steroids, okay? And that's his full-time job to lift weights. But they'll sell these young guys all these protein supplements and creatine. And I think it's a good idea to stay away from that stuff. Thank you. Adriana wants to know, excuse me, maybe it's Adriana, is a water softener good to use? A water softener? Um, I, I I have to think, I know, be a little careful about it. I mean, it depends what you're substituting out. You know, sometimes you're, you're like removing what, like hard things, like think like maybe calcium and you're putting sodium in there. Uh, I would just remove that with a water filter. So you might want that to soften your water to sort of protect the pipes in your house or, you know, the, the shower area. But, you know, as far as drinking it, you know, it's good to filter your water. You know, the carbon filter removes all the organic stuff. So it'll remove the estrogenic chemical. It's not going to remove the, the fluoride. Um, reverse osmosis will remove fluoride, distillation will remove fluoride. And I think there's some other methods too, but I'm not as familiar with those. Okay, thanks. Okay, let me, I'll, I'll go back to the chat in a moment, but I'll read some of the ones that were submitted in advance. They may not be on this topic. So if you don't want to answer them, that's okay. This is from Julie. She wants to know if a whole food plant-based diet provides enough long chain fatty acids, EPA and DHA. If not, do you recommend a supplement and how much? I think you get enough from the plant foods. And Dr. McDougall's talked about that pretty extensively because um, you have the precursors there, you know, the ALA, for example. And also a lot, of, I think we need more omega-6 than is widely realized, but either way you, you can get them from plant foods. So that's that's what I would do. Okay. Um, I'll take one for the chat now. Jack oh, yeah, actually, let me, excuse, I'll add one thing to that. For example, you know, one of the, the recommendations people say, oh, well, it's going to fluidize your neuronal cell membranes and speed up neuronal conduction. I'm not so sure about that. I worry about issues with lipid peroxidation because those are PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids. And, you know, why do you have to put them into a container that's opaque and get them into the fridge as fast as possible? Because they're prone to rancidity, lipid peroxidation. The more double bonds you have, the more rapidly you undergo lipid peroxidation. We can still remember things from our childhood because our neurons don't turn over too much. Okay. So the, the amount that you need is probably less than is is expected. So there's a little more on that. I've given separate lectures on it, but I, I, it's, it's sort of, I consider it kind of a non-issue. Thank you. Uh, this is from Laurel. She says, I'm 64 years old and I've been eating whole food plant-based and SOS free for more than 12 years. However, during the pandemic, I was diagnosed with hypothyroid. I've been taking levothyroxine ever since. And my doctor insists I do not have Hashimoto's, but he did not test me for iodine deficiency because Kaiser doesn't do that. I do dulse every day for iodine. I also continue to need blood pressure medications despite my diet. Can this be causing the hypothyroid? What else causes hypothyroid in otherwise healthy people? What tests can I get to see if I need more iodine and how would you recommend I take it? And what other suggestions do you have for getting off levothyroxine? Okay, well, first of all, I'm not an expert on thyroid, but a couple thoughts here. 
most common things are autoimmune diseases. So I realized, you know, she was told she doesn't have Hashimoto's. There's also Grave's disease. And what I'm saying is I would look through the list of all the things that cause leaky gut and I would avoid them, every single one of them as much as I could. Um, and especially having adequate dietary fiber protects the gut, but there's a whole bunch of things, you know, a meat-based diet, there's two main types of bacterial flora in the gut. Either you eat a meat, oil, and, and processed food diet, then you don't get the good bacteria. The good bacteria feed on fiber. So you want a lot of dietary fiber and the dietary fiber, good bacteria, they produce a short chain fatty acids like butyric acid, which is used by the in, intestinal lining cells to maintain their tight junctions and prevent leaky gut. If you prevent leaky gut, that's the main factor in preventing autoimmune disease, which could help you to prevent these things. By eating hundred percent plant-based, you avoid the proteins analogous, let's say in a hot dog that might contain thyroid proteins that could lead to uh, cross-reactivity of antibodies and autoimmune disease. Okay, then what else? We talked about this F minus stuff. Um, F minus potentially can damage, uh, it can compete with iodine for incorporation into the thyroid and it can also damage tissues and potentially predispose to autoimmune disease. There's other things that can predispose to autoimmune disease. Uh, chlorine, for example, also is a halogen. When you use a carbon filter, you're gonna remove chlorine. It's another halogen. How much does it affect hypothyroid? I'm not as sure. Soy is associated with hypothyroidism. I would avoid that. I would avoid anything associated with hypothyroidism. I think some of the, even like the cruciferous vegetables have been associated, I think weakly with hypothyroidism. But if that was an issue for me where I was, you know, was marginal borderline to coming off a, a med that I might be able to come off of, I would look into all that stuff. Thanks. Thank you. This is from Jane and she wanted to know, I sometimes write really long stuff, so I have to look. It was about what percentage, oh boy. Ah, uh, sorry, it was here a second ago. Yes, what percentage of our diet should be fruit and what percentage should be vegetables in order to get protein levels below to 10% or below? Okay, I'm kind of smiling because there's a whole big debate on all this stuff. Uh, basically the plant food with the most protein is all the beans. So if you're trying to lower your, your protein intake, you know, avoiding beans would be the fastest way to drop down. If you're eating hundred percent plant-based plant foods in general tend to be low in protein other than the beans. Um, so that'd be the fastest way to get down. Fruits tend to be very low in protein and part of whenever something's low in protein, it tends to be more alkaline too. And there's, there's some reasons why sometimes you would prefer that. Uh, the grains are sort of intermediate in the amount of protein they have, like oatmeal and quinoa have a sort of relatively high protein, if you will, uh, compared to, for example, rice, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes, I think are about four and a half percent of their calories from protein. Uh, rice in the ballpark of 7% white rice. Some will say a little lower, some will say a little higher. Uh, regular potatoes in the ballpark of eight and a half, nine percent of protein. You know, you're talking about with oatmeal, I think you're getting into the ballpark of 14% and quinoa is in that 14, 15% in that ballpark. So those are all ways you can lower your protein intake if you want to. Um, and, and yeah, we don't need much protein. I think, you know, it's been said before that it's impossible to be too, too, too low in protein if you're eating a sort of a natural occurring plant-based diet. Uh, and, and that's based on human breast milk having only about five to 6% protein. And there's been studies where they feed people two and a half percent protein and that were starving previously. And they did real well on that. Um, do you eat white rice? Oh yeah, I do. I still eat white rice. You know, I try to get it organic. I try to get it grown, for example, in California, somewhere where they don't, they don't do a lot of previous textile cotton farming because they used to spray uh, arsenic type pesticides on the textile crops, which had a different designation because they were textile rather than a food crop, they could spray more arsenic on them. So it takes a long time to get the arsenic out of the soils. And so that's why I avoid uh, rice from those areas. Um, even, the, even the more ideal organic rice will still have some arsenic, but I rinse it typically once, sometimes twice. And I think that minimizes it reasonably well. Um, and you can kind of, I also, I don't eat the white rice by itself. I'll eat it with a bunch of other food, other starches and blueberries and other fruits. And so I figure that even though it has, it inhibits glycolysis sort of at two spots, sort of in the middle of glycolysis and right at the end. I figure I have a workaround with this other stuff. So I'm okay with it. You can't completely avoid it. There's far more arsenic in things like chicken, for example, and some of these other processed foods than there is in rice. Right. What do you think of the Kempner diet? And did you happen to catch my show last week with Dr. Clarence Grimm, who is uh, one of the leading experts on hypertension, who said that where there is no salt, there is no high blood pressure? Oh, yes. I, I actually saw his lecture. I thought that was very interesting. It's very good. Um, and, and that's interesting too, I think was with, uh, the work of this, uh, this book, Richard Moore, and he talks about that. He says, look at the epidemiology all around the world. The more plants people eat, the more potassium they get, 
the less likely they are to have hypertension. And if they don't add salt to their food, they don't ever get hypertension. So what I think is they're sort of in the United States, people have this assumption, well, you get older, you're going to be hypertensive. That's just normal. And it's not because these other populations don't get it. And then when some people say, well, the most important thing is to lower your fat versus the most important thing is to lower your sodium. I think that you just automatically do it when you eat plant-based because the plant foods are going to have lots of potassium. They're going to be naturally low in sodium. And so you're going to get yourself in a good direction. One of the things that was real interesting though, I thought when there's Richard Moore's book, we're getting related to sodium. He said, even if you lower your dietary sodium, increase your potassium, a certain amount that you don't get much of a change in blood pressure, he says, the patients end up being way healthier. They have a dramatically reduced risk of stroke. And I think the reason is because you're fixing all those other processes that are dependent on the sodium potassium gradient. So it's hypertension is just a symptom of having abnormal sodium and potassium gradients in your cells. And what I'm also saying is, that every cell in your body is significantly messed up, if you will, functioning poorly if you're eating a high salt diet and you're not getting enough potassium. So it's a lot more to it than hypertension. Right. Um, Christy would like to know what percent of your diet is raw versus cooked? Oh, and again, I smile because I know there's all these different points of views and debates about this. I eat, gosh, probably about 35% of my calories uh, raw in the sense of fruits and vegetables. I used to eat a salad and I eat a lot of fruits and I like that. I'm pretty healthy about that. I'm, I'm pretty thin and fit and it, it's working for me. And I exercise a reasonably good amount, moderate amount, I guess you would call it. Um, and so that works. I know there's, you know, Dr. McDougall will say, oh, eat up to 90% starches. And he's a lot of times working with older patients that maybe they don't exercise as much or maybe trying to get them out of a difficult spot. You know, they're overweight. I think if you're younger and you exercise more, not necessarily younger, but if you exercise more and you're relatively thin, I like eating fruits. And I think, you know, our vision is to see fruits when they're ripe in a sense, and perhaps even the different varieties of colors, if you will, the, for the variety of the antioxidants, I'm not sure about that, but it certainly seems that the color to recognize ripeness seems to be related to our vision. Um, and, you know, there's no other animal that cooks its food. Uh, people tend to feel good on fruits. I've seen a lot of athletes that eat primarily fruits. There was a guy, I think his name is Michael Arnstein. He's one of these ultra marathoner guys. And he was eating like 25 to 30 pounds of fruit per day. The guy looks fantastic and he's running, you know, hundred mile races. He's a pretty fit guy. Um, uh, I seen a lot of guys like that. Garth Davis gave a lecture too, and he runs triathletes and stuff. He's, he's seen a lot of really fit, almost fruitarian like person. So, and I know the mastering diabetes guys eat tons and tons of fruit. So I'm, what I'm saying is I think fruits are pretty good. You got to be a little careful though. Some of the modern stuff has been sort of processed or, you know, bred to be extra sweet. And I think if you don't exercise much, um, you could potentially become fat from that because you could be kind of getting like a, a fructose bolus effect. So <laughs> these are big topics. Cause then we have to get into all the different stuff. And then there's the, there's the bicycle guy. I, I like him. He's kind of crazy, but I like him that durian rider guy who says, Oh no, I need to eat more fruit, more sugar and all this. And that gets, so this gets into all these big side topics. What is the metabolism of fructose? And there's difference between fructose coming from a fruit where it's packaged, if you will, with the fiber and it comes in small amounts versus I think it's a, a bad idea. All these fructose sweetened beverages where you get this giant bolus of fructose coming in. Right. Because then it goes liver and fatty liver and all that. Uh, you know, I, there's a lot of people I've had on the show, like Dr. Doug Graham, 80, 10, 10, and they do mostly fruit. And I'm not here to argue whether it's healthy or not healthy, but I, I just don't find fruit as satisfying as starch as a person that eats. Well, starch is more readily available. Starch stores for a lot longer. Um, it's easy, you know, the starch to, to get fruit, it spoils fast and it's very expensive and it's a very seasonal thing, whereas, you know, beans, rice, that stuff stores for a long time. Oatmeal, it's very convenient to eat it. So I know I'll have a tendency sometimes to overeat when I eat fruits. And there's even some fruits I don't even eat anymore because I know I overeat them all the time, like apples. I was like, I find myself eating 10 apples in a row so fast. I'm like, holy crap, I just plowed through 10 apples. What's going oh on here? God. I'm wondering if maybe they're spraying something on. I'm like, why is this taste so good, you know? So That's interesting. I worry about the wax coating too. I wonder, does that potentially get absorbed? Is that potentially atherogenic? I don't know if it is. I couldn't, I tried looking it up. I couldn't find information. It's interesting. Uh, Jane would like to know, Dr. Rogers, do you personally use a microwave? No, I don't. I think they're a bad idea. When I bought my first house, you know, when kid was young, I was all interested in electronics. 
And I bought all these different types of electronic testers and I tested everything in the house. Okay. And I tested actually all the different roads. I tested going beneath the power lines. I tested a whole bunch of things. And one of the things I, I learned from that was microwave gives off tons of energy more than anything else by far in the whole house. Even when it's not turned on, it's giving off tons of energy. The other thing I do is I would put the cell phone inside the microwave and then call it. And it would always ring, meaning that it's incompletely shielded. So somehow, you know, that's transmitting microwaves itself, the phone frequencies, somehow they're getting in and out of that microwave. And so I said to myself, you know, I don't like that idea. You got to be real careful what's behind it. I don't know where it's less shielded than more shielded, but it seemed like a bad idea. When it's on, it's off the charts. If you had one in the room, I would get out of the room. It used to be even in, in some of these other countries, they wouldn't even allow them. They were illegal for a while because people were worried about the danger of them. I mean, look what it does to a, a hamburger, okay? It's an incredibly powerful thing. So I know some people like it for the speed and the convenience, but I think it's a bad idea. You know, I'll see people sometimes heating up a baby's bottle and they'll be standing right next to it in front of it. You know, I don't think that's a wise thing to do. Uh, for a while, some of my family members insisted on having one and I would make them at least get out of the kitchen while it was on, you know, get more than 30 feet away from it because it would give up incredibly high amounts of EMF, electromotive force. So I, I think they're a bad idea, but I do know some people like them for the convenience. So I wonder what they do to the food too. You know, they, they distort it, just denature it. I don't know if that's a healthy thing. Interesting. Thank you. Do you know anything about tooth decay or I could save this for another doctor if it's not your area of expertise? Well, tooth decay is not my expertise, but basically, you know, they'll often form based on the food particles between the teeth. Anything sweet or anything acidic is going to predispose to tooth decay and you don't make as much uh, saliva at night. So if you're leaving food on your mouth at night, that makes the risk a lot worse. Also, sometimes people are taking medications that decrease their saliva production. Sometimes they have an autoimmune disease, let's say Sjogren's, and that decreases the saliva production as well. They're going to have a higher risk of cavities, you know, leaving the bottle in the baby's mouth once it's got teeth. You know, there's a lot of things like that will increase the risk. So I would avoid it. Basically, my sort of approach to life is be like Adam and Eve, but with indoor heating and plumbing and try to prevent all the problems as much as you can so that you don't have to go and, you know, go through all this expensive stuff and, get x-rays of your face and have people going around with the slow drill. Oh my God. I love that. Be like Adam and Eve, but with indoor heating and plumbing. But the reason is her question, Joy's question was if an exclusively whole food plant-based sofas free diet could prevent or even reduce tooth decay, because she says there's a book called the Cure Tooth Decay book that has had success advocating an unprocessed diet with the consumption of raw milk, fermented cod liver oil, and organ meat. Are there equivalent well, vegan sources of the vitamins and minerals found in these foods that could remineralize teeth? I think you get plenty of uh, all the nutrients you need from eating a whole food plant-based diet. I don't think you need those other things. Um, whether or not you're going to be able to fix a cavity once it's already occurred, I don't know. You might be able to stop it from progressing, but you know, I don't know for certain. All I can say is since I've sort of paid attention to these things for over 25 years, I've never had a tooth problem. I got all my teeth. Everything feels great. My mouth feels great and everything works fine. My teeth might not be as, as bright white as they should be. I think it's from blueberry stains. Like I said, that was the only reason why I, I went to get it. Cause I think, I think they're getting stained a little. So I was going to brush them. I even forgot to brush them. <laughs> so I, I, I better not make a big smile because my teeth probably got a little blueberry stain on them, but they're fine. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, Jackie, who's watching live says, is having high magnesium, but low sodium in blood tests normal for people who are a whole food plant-based vegan? Well, your magnesium might be a little higher. A lot of it's out in storage, you know, intracellular. It's an intracellular thing primarily. So it's going to be, I don't even know. It's hard to measure magnesium too in the blood. You know, I don't know for sure even necessarily what it means a lot of times, because there's all these special tests to tell what your magnesium levels are. So I'm not actually sure completely on the answer to that question. And then the question of the sodium is how low is it? Is it, you know, lower than the normal ranges? I sort of wouldn't drive myself crazy about that unless it's a potentially a problem. You're below the normal ranges. I just focus on getting enough potassium, but I, I don't know how low that person's sodium is. And that's not something I routinely manage. Uh, I'm talking like in general for healthy persons, there are a whole bunch of sodium specific conditions, you know, autonomic hypotension and all that stuff. So that's outside my scope, but that's rare stuff. Uh, for the average person, it's a question of, are you getting enough potassium? Right. So um, Ellen says, if I could ask you a question, I asked the arthritis expert yesterday, what do you think causes arthritis in our pets? Oh, well, that's sort of a tough question, but 
I was alluding to some things that might be relevant. We talk about an atherosclerosis leads to, you know, block of the arteries makes everything worse. It's also acidic. You know, animals are different though. You got a dog. I mean, a dog's designed to eat meat. It's an omnivorous animal. Um, you know, the F minus stuff can make animals unhealthy. It'll can cause calcification, the lim- ligaments and stuff, but you know, good luck figuring out if that's in your, in your, in your, your pet's food. Um, so that would be a hard one for me to know. You know I mean? If it's in your water, you know, the dog's drinking the same water, F minus water, most water, municipal water is fluoridated in this country. Um, you have a dog, right? Yes. Because one of the viewers that says to ask you about your dog in a video you made with your dog. Well, the way that worked was another like, see, in marriage, a husband gets used to losing most arguments with a wife. A wife's got extra methods of winning arguments. Okay. And then one of the things that happens though is, for example, I really wanted a dog and my wife didn't want a dog at this time. So I finally said, that's it. I'm getting a dog because a friend offered me a free dog. I said, I'm going to my friend's house. I'm getting this dog right now. I'm bringing it home. And she's like, no, you're not. I'll get the dog. I'll be in charge of the dog. And she was all happy that she got to pick her dog instead of me getting to pick the dog. But I wanted that to happen. And the reason is because she got to pick the dog and it's her dog, she's stuck with all the responsibility. She's got to train it. She's got to clean up after it. So that was another one of the few argument situations I've won in marriage, but that worked out pretty well. I'd love to meet your wife. <laughs> <laughs> but he said something about the dog in the basement peeing or something. Oh yeah. Talking. Yeah. I made a video called, you know, lifestyles of rich and famous doctors. And the joke of it is we got two dogs and they piss on the floor and then the piss drops down into the basement. And I'm kind of like this old homeless person. I practically like live in the basement and I've got tons of books overflowing with book. I read hundreds of books every year. And so I don't even have a place to put them anymore. So I got them stacked up in boxes and crates. I keep the ones I care about the most on shelves, but the dog's piss drips down into the basement. So I have to cover up my piles of books with paper towels. So that was kind of one of the jokes of the video is that, yeah, here's my rich and famous lifestyle. I'm trying to hide my books from the dog piss, you know? Oh my gosh. Uh, Jackie says, any thoughts on what would cause daily muscle twitching in a healthy young lady? Uh, I don't know for sure the answer for that. You know, you can sometimes talk about calcium being too high or too low. Sometimes you can get palpitations and muscle twitching just from uh, sleep deprivation. You can get it from uh, caffeine. Um, So I would consider those things. Okay, let's see. I don't know if you, I, you know, we need to get a veterinarian on to, I, I can't, why do pets get hypothyroidism? That, that, that's not really your, not, not something you do. Yeah, I wouldn't be too knowledgeable about that. Yeah, absolutely. I, maybe I, you know, I, I would love to get like, actually a, like a vegan vet or a holistic vet on that would be one way. I think I saw all the questions in the chats. Oh, do, do you use an air fryer or would you use an air fryer? Or is that the same to you as a microwave? Uh, I don't know too much about them. I certainly wouldn't want to use any oil on making my food, but I'm not that fussy. So like, I'm real happy to have my food. And I, I think wherever it comes from is a psycho- psychology. And I'm a big believer on get your psychology correct. And what I mean by that is what motivates you? What's important to you? And basically all day long, I see all these disaster patients. They're really sad. It's one disaster after another. And like I said, chronic disease, you can't fix it with a drug or surgery. And so it's almost kind of sad. And so my attitude is I am so lucky. I went through a fat phase in my thirties and I'm like, I don't have to be fat anymore. I don't have to worry about any of these diseases. I'm so happy. I'm so grateful. And I love the taste of the food and it's kind of simple. And maybe because I always have it simple, I'm used to it being simple and it works for me. I'm happy. Everything's good. And, um, you know, and, and sort of, I, I like to be that way. And that's actually like, I think one of my secrets of success in life in, in the things that I'm successful at is that I'm really simple. And by being really simple, I don't waste time because I see a lot of people get distracted and all kinds of peripheral things. And so by me saying, okay, I only got so much more time in life. I'm going to focus on the things I care about and really try to do as well as I can in those areas. I think that I can like overachieve in the areas I care about because I don't do anything with the other areas. For example, I'll just bring up the wife again one more time because it relates to my life. She wanted to control a whole bunch of things related to the house. And I'm like, fine, go ahead, go ahead, sweetheart. Yeah, you you know, you're good at that. You take care of that, great. And so what that led to was she has to take care of all the bills. Well, that's a big pain in the butt because that takes hours of time every week. Well, fine, good. They frees me up to have more time to do what I want to do. So by, by, avoiding things and oversimplifying. Like I'll, I'll share with you, like, for example, once I wanted, one time I was really busy and I wanted to write a book 
And so what I did was I, I said to myself, I will not waste any time, no social media. I did almost nothing that I didn't have to do for that time. So I would go to sleep early every night, wake up early, and I cranked it out super fast. And what I'm saying is that I think is a big spot where achievements come from. I seen achievements come from number one, simplifying one's life. So you got more time to focus on and what matters. And number two, um, incrementalism, meaning that constantly grab extra time or extra work from little spots that no one would think about. For example, reading in the bathroom. I read tons of books in the bathroom. You know, every number two, I got a textbook on a table. Every number one, I got a paperback. And because of that, I'll be able to crank through all this material. Like I'll be like, how did you get through all that material? Then I'll find an audio CD I can listen to in the car. So just in those ways, I'll have, I'll, I'll get through tons of material. So, so that's what I'm saying is you can become real knowledge about something pretty fast. If you do that and you seek out conversations with people who are experts and you watch the online videos, you know, so um, there's a good opportunities to educate myself because most people will tell you, oh, I'm too busy. I can't read this book. I can't watch this video. I can't do all these things. But if you sit down and strategize, how can I absorb all this information? There's a lot you can do. What kind of dog did your wife ultimately choose? Oh, gosh. She's, she's like, she's like the queen of dogs. Okay. She walks around the house. All the dogs follow her. I can't even walk in the kitchen when she's got the dogs following her. We've had like every type of dog. We've had Rottweilers. I know we didn't have a Rottweiler. My brother had a Rottweiler. We had a Great Dane. We've had German Shepherds. We've had these Terriers. She likes a small dog. She'll sleep with a small dog with its butt in her face. And I'm like, you really like that? She's like, oh, it feels like a baby. You know, I'm like, oh, okay, great. Oh my you know? God, you're hilarious. Does she watch you at all? Like, does she watch any <laughs> of your content? Well, I'll tell you, you know, I think some of these things too, well, there's, there's a whole bunch of funny stories about that sort of stuff. For example, at our old house, I would be in charge of the lawn, right? So, because it was sort of my house, the exercise house. And I'm like, I'm not spraying any stuff on the grass. I hate all that stuff. And so I would do it with a push mower and I hate all the loud mowers because it hurts my ears, all the loud noise. So I would use a push mower, but then there were a lot of Dan line, Danny lines and I would try to pull them out by hand, but there were too many of them and they would laugh at me and they go, oh, you're like Sisyphus. And I'm like, yeah, okay, fine. And then they say, well, you have the worst lawn on the block. You're lowering the property values. You're a jerk, you know? And I'm like, well, you know what? This is better for us. It's not that bad. So, but what, what am I getting at? Well, now she took over the lawn. She'll spray that stuff on it, you know, the, the dandelion preventer stuff. But then the dog will roll around in it and then the dog will come in the bed. I say, you are now just exposing yourself to all that stuff, okay? So it's kind of getting on a sidetrack there, but that's an example of what I would call a chemical exposure that is preventable. And as a matter of fact, back at the old house, I actually went around and told all the neighbors, you know, you shouldn't spray your grass because you can get these chemicals. And I looked up all these papers on it. And not a single person paid attention to me. My wife told me I was a jerk and uh, I just let it go. But th that's kind of, this kind of thing. So I sort of like retreat into myself. No one really cares about these things. Most people are totally oblivious of all these things. And that's just how it is. And that's how it's always going to be. So, you know, that's partly like why I'll write a book. I'll go, I got all these good ideas. And if anybody wants to read, it's there. And I realize not many people do, but it's there. And now I like videos because people are a lot more likely to watch a video than to, to read. So for the ones who want to know, there's a lot of useful things to know. Yeah. Okay. I know you eat your food plain. Uh, you eat very simply. Do you add any spices at all or any type of sauce? I don't, you know, it's kind of like, you know, there was a bit of a joke with uh, Nathan Pritikin and Dr. McDougall. The Pritikin was really simple. I actually feel very much in common with Nathan Pritikin. When I read Nathan Pritikin's book, I feel like I'm talking to myself. I'm like, oh yeah, he's right. He's right. He's right. That's how I think. He's right. He's right. And so I'm, I'm just real simple. It's like, I don't need anything. A lot of people are like, well, don't you want to do this? Don't you want to do this? Don't you want to do this? I'm like, no, it's good. I just eat it the way it is. I'm fine. You know, I, I, I'm i not the guy to go to for fancy advice or for nuance on those types of things. I'm I'm happy with what I got and it's simple. No, I, you know, I agree with you. I eat like that and I'm technically a chef and then people are like, they they roll their eyes. Like, I can't believe you. Because I eat the same thing for lunch every day for 12 years, Hannah yams and broccoli, because I really like it and I don't put anything on it. It kind of ruins the food when you over sauce it. Anyway. Yeah, it, it's good the way it is. I think so too. Uh, Ellen says, what kind of hospital do you work at? And do any of your colleagues watch any of your ancillary stuff? Well, I noticed that a lot of people become interested in health when they start having a health problem or they start waking up to because doctors do not learn nutrition and they do not learn um, toxicology. So then they get a little older and they start becoming fat and they start having problems and then they become very interested in these things. So I, I've noticed a lot of people are interested in these things and, and they will, they'll sometimes, you know, have questions about it and they'll sometimes talk to me about it. Uh, but 
most of what I do is I do a lot of neuroradiology. Um, I used to do a lot of surgery. I was primarily an imaging guided surgeon called an interventional radiologist earlier in my career, if you will. And then I've gradually sort of become mostly a neuroradiologist. I'll do other types of radiology as well. General radiology, you know, body imaging, if you will. So I'll still do some procedures, but I mostly do neuroradiology. That's things like looking at brain MRIs. And if you wanted to ask somebody like, what am I probably best known for? It'll be solving very complex brain cases because I've read like all kinds of weird, bizarre papers on the brain. So when somebody's That's got some bizarre brain disease, they'll ask me. Interesting. Thanks. Marley says, any tips on, on low hemoglobin with a plant-based diet? Well, it would depend on how the person feels. I mean, are they symptomatic with the low hemoglobin and how chronic it is? If you have a new change with a drop in hemoglobin, you, you'd want to ask yourself why. You know, it's a woman, a lot of times they think they have abnormal menstrual bleeding, you know, just maybe they got fibroids, things like that. But, you know, postmenopausal woman or a man who has a new onset, low hemoglobin, and then they worry, you know, first thing you worry about, is it a colon cancer? And they'll potentially get colonoscopy for that. But if a person has a chronic, slightly low hemoglobin, that might actually be normal for them. It sort of depends. Okay, great. Um, CN wants to know if a low fat diet is sustainable. Oh, yeah, it's completely sustainable. Um, rice only has 1% fat, you know, remember, look at these Asian countries like China, for example, before 1975, a billion out of a billion people is skinny. Um, sweet potatoes only have about 1% fat. Uh, same thing with regular potatoes. So populations that eat calories, they tend to all be skinny. That's a good thing. And those are very enjoyable foods. You know, if we've talked about potatoes being the most satisfying food, um, so it's not normal for people to be fat. We just think in America, it's normal to be fat. You look at other animals in the wild, none of them are fat. Um, and, and humans didn't used to be fat. That's a, this is sort of a, a new thing, all these fat people. And it's because they're eating so much processed food and so much oils. Yeah. And all and the estrogenic chemicals. People didn't used to weigh and measure their food either. Yeah, I don't do any of that stuff. I think you drive yourself crazy. If you eat the healthy foods, your weight's just probably going to go to a, a good number. You know, you eat low caloric density, low fat foods. Uh, your weight is just likely improved. Now it is more difficult for some people. I think that this issue of the estrogenic chemicals is under-recognized because that's estrogen is sort of a fat storage hormone and it predisposes to weight gain as if, you know, telling the body store weight because the baby might need that for energy. And so there's a tremendous amount of estrogenic chemicals in the environment for multiple reasons. They're good for making plastics. They make wonderful preservatives. So they're super common in the drinking water and, you know, in the packaging of foods and in deodorants and other sources as preservatives. So I think a lot of people are exposed to them and that makes them predisposed to being fat. So they're going to have to make extra effort uh, to eat these low fat diets and to, to prevent becoming obese. Plus there's the epigenic component. If the, if the mother was, you know, in a starvation phase or a cigarette smoker or stressed out, then the baby gets the so-called thrifty gene, if you will, where it's predisposed to gaining weight or hanging on to calories more. So all of these things can make it more difficult for some people to lose weight, but the vast majority of persons, if they eat a low fat uh, vegan diet, their weight's going to be pretty good. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, do you, <laughs> this is a funny question, especially for you, any advice on hair loss? Cause <laughs> you kind of lost yeah, it's a little bit late for me, but, um, one thought is that, you know, to get blood to the top of the head, that's the farthest thing away from the heart and persons who, um, have atherosclerosis, they're more predisposed to getting it. Some of it's genetic, of course, mm -hmm. Um, I did notice when I went 100% low fat vegan, I actually had more hair growth on the top of my head than I did before. And I don't think I ever was that atherogenic, but I don't know. Uh, my father was bald on the top of his head as well. I have heard that, you know, persons eating plant-based diets are significantly less likely to have hair loss. Um, I heard other people talk about a testosterone relationship, which I'm not sure about, but I would think that, you know, if I could do my life all over again, what would I do? I would eat 100% vegan from the beginning, whole food vegan from the beginning. Because I think you age better. Like, you know, the high fat and the high animal protein, they both activate mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, which is the growth pathway and nutrient sensing pathway that when it's activated, it's primarily rate limiting step tends to be leucine, also insulin resistance. So things that cause insulin resistance and things that provide leucine, meat, animal protein has a lot more leucine in it. They cause increased rates of cell division. And the relevance is there's something called the Hayflick limit, meaning that a body cell, non-germ cell, so non-ovary or, or testicle cell, um, and non-stem cell, they will replicate more rapidly. And once they reach about 60 cell divisions, they're predisposed to um, what is called going into senescence, stopping growing and, and dying. And what am I saying? What I'm saying is you accelerate aging when you, um, when you eat the meat and the high fat diets. 
not great. Uh, this question, I don't know if you're familiar with Paul Chatlin, but the question is, is do you have a thought about the fact that he got a heart blockage after eating the Esselstyn protocol and low cholesterol, but he had really serious heart disease to begin with. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not familiar with him and I don't know the details of his, of his situation, but uh, I haven't been real impressed by the Esselstyn stuff. I actually went out and, and went to Esselstyn's course and stuff and talked to him. I kind of had a fun time going out there and I've seen lots of other cardiologists say they've gotten the same results from his work. And I saw analogous changes in the lipids of myself and other people I know when they went on the Esselstyn diet. So I'm a convinced believer in it. Um, I'm, la I'm, I'm smiling to myself though, because when I went out to his course and stuff and the, the meeting, I would say, well, what about this mechanism? What about this mechanism? And he goes, let me talk to you later. And he comes up to me and he goes, Pete, he says, I just need to get these persons to know about nitric oxide. All this other stuff, it's just going to confuse them. If they know about nitric oxide, they'll eat the right thing and everything will be good with them. And the details don't really matter at this point. And I kind of laughed because that's kind of like a surgeon mentality. We just need to get the job done. We don't care about the details. Uh, it was just funny. This question is from Steph. Are microvascular changes readily seen on an MRI? And would that be reported on a regular MRI reading? Yeah, when you look at a typical brain MRI, it's very common to see these bright spots um, in the center of the brain called the periventricular regions. And the typical report, it's typically going to be what's called a flare sequence. Basically, an MRI, if you talk about animals, there's plant kingdom and animal kingdom, if you will. In MRI, there's T1 and T2 sequences. T1 fluid is dark, T2 fluid is bright. So anything bright spot is going to be called like a T2 hyperintensity. That means bright spot. So what I'm saying is the standard macro for dictating a brain MRI is going to be Periventricular flare hyperintensity is most likely due to small vessel atherosclerotic disease. And what am I saying? I see them all the time. You expect to see some in a person over 55 years of age in the United States. That's just routine to see them. You don't have to have them. I've seen plenty of 80 year olds that don't have a single one. And I think that's what you want. Those are basically typically silent strokes, if you will, small areas of brain damage. And most of the time they're in what's called the association cortex, meaning there is, sorry, the association uh, white matter, whereby that connects different neurons. And so the person will not have a symptomatic stroke, but that's part of the process just becoming cognitively slower as they get older. And you want to avoid this stuff. There's multiple reasons why that could happen. It could happen for all these reasons we talked about, those mouse equivalent reasons, overtreatment of hypertension, you know, carotid atherosclerosis, endocranial atherosclerosis. So the good news about this, this um, low fat vegan diet, low sodium is you don't just improve one thing, you improve everything. It's good for all your cells getting the, the so-called K factor, more potassium relative to sodium, that improves function in every single cell in your body. So you simultaneously improve everything. And one of the reasons why I was so interested in this stuff was having advanced cognitive function was very important to me in my younger years. And also I read a lot and I would see some of these authors who would just progressively not be such a good writer when they get into their 60s or 70s, they no longer could write like they used to. They used to be funny and fast and clever. And I'm like, gosh, I don't want to end up like that guy. So I spent, a, and also because I look at demented brains every day. So I'm very much in the habit of saying, how can you avoid this? And I spent a lot of time, extensive work on figuring out why do people get demented? What can you do to avoid it? And low fat vegan is a big part of uh, avoiding dementia. Yeah. You know, I'm curious, you, you spend so much time working and, and gleaning your knowledge on these topics. Do you do like anything for fun that would like, we might consider fun, like do you ever doing, like, go to a movie or watch TV or, you know, the things that like regular people do? Well, I love some of those old movies. You know, I, I love the Amadeus movie. I love a lot of the old movies. I think a lot of the modern movies, I don't like them. I think they're too sort of much action and special effects. I don't like that kind of stuff. Um. I don't have that much time. I certainly could enjoy all those things, but you know, there's not that much time. You know, I wish, I wish I was wealthy. Like if I had my perfect dream come true, some rich person would subsidize me and I could just really dig through all these papers. And cause I, I, you know, not to brag, but I figured out I have the ability to see connections hey. between complex biochemistry. And I think there's a lot of great information there. That's not widely known because the PhDs, they haven't connected it, but I could connect it. Well, I don't see why that's an unreasonable dream. I mean, it's kind of almost in the way what Dr. Greger did creating a nonprofit. So. Yeah, but I stink at business. I stink at business. I stink at marketing. I'm just sort of a nerdy scholar type guy. And I, you know, I don't, you know, you got to know what you're good at, what you're not good at. And I'm not like a networking guy or a business guy or any of that stuff. What I'm good at is, you know, 
having a whole bunch of topics and figuring it out together, how to connect it all. Like, for example, I think there's a lot of work been done on insulin resistance as it relates to hypertension, obesity, and cognitive impairment. That's not widely known. And I, I find it fascinating to read about all this stuff and it all just reinforces what we've already talked about. But what I'm saying is a lot of the, the reasons for all the things we've heard about, or even that we haven't heard about, they're already figured out. It's just a question of going through all the papers and putting it together. Uh, Jackie wants to know if you speak Spanish. I'm curious if you speak any other languages, because I heard that's good for your brain to learn another language. Oh, yeah. And people who speak, who are bilingual, they're less likely to become demented. I sort of had the situation. My mother was from Puerto Rico and she was fluent in Spanish. But, you know, back in those days, everybody thought America was by far the best place in the whole world and you didn't need to learn Spanish. And I think my dad kind of pressured my mom not to teach us Spanish right when we were first born. And then when we went to Montessori, my mom came over there and gave talks about it. But once a kid can say no, they don't want to learn anything. They say no to everything they can. And then I took it in school. And, you know, and all you do in school is answer grammar questions. It's a joke. I know people who majored in college in Spanish and they still can't speak Spanish. So I knew enough Spanish to have like kind of lousy Spanish conversation with my mother, but not very good. And then what happened was after my mom died, I was kind of like, and also I was a total workaholic for a lot of years. And, um, so anyways, after my mom died, I was real sad about it. And when I said, you know what, I'm so pissed off. I didn't ever become fluent in Spanish. I'm going to really study it. And so I studied it for um, about, you know, six months. And I and then had a tutor like from Berlitz, one of these places. And I was doing pretty good. They kept telling me I'm doing so great. But then I talked to one of the guys, like a friend of mine. And I'm like, you know, how you doing? Como estas? He's like, jodido pero contento. And so I didn't immediately know how to answer that or what he meant. You know, it sort of meant I'm screwed in life, but now I'm content with it. I'm okay with it. So everything's everything's fine. And the point was, I realized I'm going down the wrong path. This grammar book, study books, none of that stuff really works. And so I started reading about all the polyglots, people who mastered a bunch of language. And I said, you got to communicate with the language. That's how a kid learns. A kid doesn't read a grammar book. So then when I took that approach, I listened to all these music and fairy tales. I had my cousin from Puerto Rico uh, record a whole bunch of fairy tales for me, the bilingual versions and in, in the Spanish. And then I could understand all that. Then I started reading the self-help level books that are a common thing, you know, Dale Carnegie's, I don't want friends influence people. And then I moved from that to Da Vinci Code, you know, the 16 audio CDs. And once I could understand all that, my Spanish was pretty good. I don't have a regular conversation partner for Spanish. I love all the Spanish music. It's a long story, but I, I, it's, I don't need to get into all the details of it, but I've studied Spanish music rather extensively and so I love all that stuff. And I love my family from Puerto Rico. I'm actually real close with them, but they're so far away. I don't get to see them. I mean, I, I would have kind of, if I could live my life over again, I would live in Puerto Rico next to a college where they have a wrestling team. Okay. But you don't get to do it over, you know? Um, and I also, I studied, I studied French. I studied Polish. I studied Italian. I loved all that stuff, but you just don't have much time as a doctor. You kind of end up being having to work full time. Um, and when you're doing that, you don't have a lot of free time, especially back when I was a surgeon, I was on call all the time. Now, now that I'm a neuroradiologist, I'm not on call that much. So I have more time than I used to, but there's only so much time in life. So I wish, I wish I had more time. I love the language because I think every time you learn a new vocabulary word, you get a release of these reward neurotransmitters in your brain. It's very enjoyable. And when you actually have those rare opportunities to converse with someone in the other language, it's a lot of fun. Spanish is a beautiful language. The other thing about Spanish is it's kind of passionate. Everything in Spanish is a drama. Everything is exaggerated. You know, mi corazón. Everything is like that in Spanish. Whereas English in comparison is kind of wimpy. It's kind of a wimpified language. And there's all this wimpified behavior that goes with speaking English versus in Spanish. It's real macho. And I, I like all that. Uh, there's also something else interesting. English though is better. You can very precisely say something. You can say something, well, maybe because I'm so used to English. You can say things very concisely. Whereas in Spanish, I'd often feel I'd have to make this roundabout approach to a topic in order to uh to say the same thing that could quickly be said in english nice what's your favorite book of all time oh gosh depends on the subject um i have to say uh, my favorite novel of all time would probably be a christmas carol by charles dickens for the redemption of scrooge i very much like the idea that a person can screw up and fail and that they can turn it around and so i like that and you know he turned it around and then tiny tim lived Okay. And everybody was happy. And so I, th I think that concept of, you know, a person screwing up, failing, but then all of a sudden being able to see things in a new way and then making an effort in sort of redeeming themselves or improving their life. I like that. That gives hope. So I found that a very enjoyable, inspiring thing. Um, gosh, what other books have I liked? Well, I mean, you, you're you're open. I believe me. I've read a lot of books. I could tell you a lot of things if you really want me to. And I've I've, I've written a lot maybe, about literature. Maybe like maybe one fiction, one nonfiction. 
Okay, so that's a fiction. What would I say is the most valuable nonfiction book? Uh, there's a lot of genres, you know, we talked about the genres like that hypertension book by Moore is, is a masterpiece. It's an absolutely brilliant book that, that clarified all common changes about the ion pumps because that then clarifies a lot of pumps for me about neurotransmitters. Um, what else? I've read so many good ones. I'm, it's, that's almost like a hard thing for me to say. I've, I've, I've made lists of my favorite medical books, my favorite uh, literature books. Have you ever uh, read Man's Search for Meaning? By Man, that's by Victor Frankel. I thought that was very good too. And I think that's true. The idea that a person has to have a purpose. And if they have that purpose, it makes them very resilient. And I think that's a very good thing. It makes you mentally strong. When you say to yourself, look, this is what my priority is going to be in life. I'm going to try to, you know, let's say be a good father. And I'm going to try to be a good scholar in this area. And you say, that is what God put me on this earth to do you generate tremendous energy. And even if a lot of other things in your life are sad and disappointment, you can handle it better because you know that you have a purpose. And that's what he talked about in the concentration camps. The persons who had that sense of purpose, they were very resilient and they tended to survive and were able to endure things and cope much better. And that reminds me of Dostoevsky. You know, Fyodor Dostoevsky, you know, he wrote Brothers Karamazov, but he also himself had been imprisoned by the czar and he was set to be executed. And then he was reprieved at the last moment. And he then had, so he had a lot of experience with that. And he said, if a person has happy childhood memories, that makes them more resilient. But I, I think that's an essential thing. And I also think, like I told you, my kids said to me, he goes, dad, why are you so happy? He says, your life sucks. He said, if my life was like yours, I wouldn't be happy. All you do is work and then you oh. study. I mean, what kind of a life is that? But you love it though. <laughs> you love what you do. I feel like I was born to do this. I mean, maybe I'm arrogant, but I know how smart I am at understanding these things. And I feel like, I'm doing something useful. I, I believe for the world that I'm trying to help people. I tell people the truth as best I can, as clear as I can. And I, and I think they seem to appreciate that. And I feel that's a valuable thing for me to do. And I'm pretty happy. I, I have to be honest. Like I was, I had a very wonderful social life up until senior year of high school. And then ever since college, I spent a lot of time being kind of lonely and alone. And luckily I enjoyed reading and, and going in the books. And I almost felt a camaraderie with a lot of these historical figures, but it enabled me, and I've seen that's a common pattern of persons who achieve some form of academic excellence is they went through a long phase of loneliness in their life where they just read and studied tremendously large amounts of time. And so I've sort of been there and done that, and I've accumulated a lot of knowledge, and I know a lot of people seem to be interested in it, so I share it with them, and I'm glad that I've got that to do. You know, I'm, I'm old. I mean, you look at me, I'm 59 years old. I'm not a spring chicken, you know, so... Yeah. I'm glad that it gives me something to do. Look, I'm older than you. How did you meet your wife? Oh, gosh, that's a story. Um, I think she kind of hypnotized me. Uh, my wife, I don't know. She just she just looked beautiful to me. She's a doctor. And, um, you know, one thing led to another. Too, my mother put a little bit of pressure on me. She said, oh, Peter, you're such a workaholic. I want a grandchild. She said, you're going to be like your uncle Willie. I have an uncle who was a, a surgeon. And he is, he is he is heartbroken by his fiance when he's young. They broke up and he never got married then uh, until he, I think he maybe got married when he's in his late 60s or something. And so it was sort of like the time was right. And um, so I met my wife. She sort of like hypnotized me. And uh, one thing led to another. And the big surprise was, you know, my sweet little fiance, she becomes my wife. And all of a sudden she's like controlling me. It's like, I talking about the magic ringer, the magic oh ring, you know, God. you got the magic oh. ring, you know, they, Herbert Spencer said it, at the wedding ceremony, the woman gets a ring on her finger, the man gets one in his nose. And I'm like, how did this happen? Well, you know, Dr. Rogers there, you know how in a Jewish wedding that there, there's a tradition to break the glass. You've heard that, right? Yeah. 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 Well, they say the reason is, is because that's the last time the man ever gets to put his foot down in the marriage. Yeah, it's kind of like I kind of learned how it is. And I've learned, though, the way to handle marriage is kind of you can't make what you want to have happen. You almost got to be kind of like, I don't know, Zen about it or something. And that ends up working out better for everybody. And it's also funny. Ben Franklin had said, you know, before marriage, a man should have his eyes wide open. Afterwards, it's probably best if he keeps them half shut. <laughs> what, what kind of doctor is your wife? She's a family practice doctor. Oh, how cool. And she's kind of like, she's kind of like a very reasonable, normal social person. Whereas like sort of in my family, I have a couple of nicknames. One of them is all these autistic nicknames, you know, Asperger syndrome and all that stuff. And I'm like, I'm just, I'm happy the way I am, you know? 
because uh, because like, I'll be walking around reading a book. There's a funny painting called The Persistent Reader, where this guy is reading and his wife's staring at him like, why do you read so much? And my wife said to me, why do you read so much? Life isn't in a book. What is wrong with you? You're autistic. And I'm like, you know, I'm happy. I'm glad I can be happy, you know, for so cheap, just sitting around looking at a book. Um, and my other nickname in the family is Steinchik. Steinchik was this sort of obsessive compulsive warrior scholar. And he was also a court jester dwarf in Poland. And so it's like to call me that is like to tease me in multiple ways simultaneously. It's like saying, you're a party pooper, no fun, warrior, stick in the mud, obsessive compulsive autistic. And so it's just kind of funny, but it's funny how metaphor can convey multiple insults simultaneously, but you know, not a big deal. It's just kind of funny. Yeah. Hey, do you know Neha Consul? Yeah, yeah, she's a very smart doctor lady. Yeah, well, uh, she's she's watching. Oh, I'm good. Hey, that's pretty cool. Uh, Ellen says, "What do you think about artificial intelligence, and what role will it play in medicine in the future?" I don't think it's going to do much good for medicine because one of the like the key things I was talking about in the beginning of the talk was you have to the personal component is super important and doing the right thing is sort of a, a social personal thing most of the time, being conscientious and thoughtful and working with the individual to help them work through their questions and their obstacles to improve in their own health. And what I'm trying to say is, I think the whole techno medicine thing is very overrated. You know what I'm saying? For example, there is no medical surgical fancy thing that's going to change the fact if you got a dietary disease, the best option is to fix the diet. And if you're being exposed to a toxin, avoid being exposed to the toxin. And so what I'm trying to say is you can have the most expensive fancy machine or computer. What difference does that make? I think it gets exaggerated. For example, there's a tendency to claim that so many diseases are genetic. Hardly anything is genetic. There might be different vulnerabilities to atherosclerosis, to obesity, for example, but I think it's a way to make money because if you say to a person, oh, your problem's genetic, then the only option is take this pill, okay, or have the surgery. There's nothing they could do to change their genetics. So- I don't think that's going to help too much. You, you can do artificial intelligence preliminary reads, let's say on an EKG, preliminary reads in the future, maybe on a brain CT, but it's going to be hard to have those become definitive. I've heard, for example, on EKGs, they want a doctor's name attached to the DK, EKG interpretation. So there's somebody to sue, for example, if there's a problem with it. Um, I just don't think that's going to be such a great thing. I also think that if you work with a person, there's there's a lot of communication that just comes from the relationship between the people. And that's, you know, highly valuable. When you're with a machine, you'll tend to have, I think, more rigid border criteria. And I think that can be detrimental because very often it takes a while to figure out where a person's coming from when you talk with them. And I'll just give you one metaphor to it. I was reading something about, um, it had something to do with psychology, this book. And it talked about how patients would communicate quite often through a metaphor. For example, it's very standard on a lot of psychology research things to have the first person fill out a bunch of check boxes. I am happy, I am sad, five out of 10, six out of 10. And what I'm trying to say is when the persons gave metaphors for how they were feeling, I think this came from one of the books by Siddhartha Mukherjee. He's written a couple of famous books. Um, I think it was called the inside a cell or something like that. This, this, whatever the signal of the cell. But the point I'm saying is those metaphors conveyed so much more information than did filling out check boxes. Artificial intelligence is going to be limited to checkbox mentality versus like, remember I told you that insult I called Steincheck. Steincheck being the obsessive compulsive warrior stick in the mud bookworm person. That's what my family will tease me. And what I'm saying is when they say that to me, it's like they've insulted me five ways all at once. And it's kind of a joke in the family, but what you, you get my point, the metaphor conveys lots of information. And when you go to artificial intelligence and start filling out checkboxes, you lose that. And I think it's detrimental to medicine. Also, I think there's pressure to commoditize doctors and make doctors write checkbox type notes. And they'll claim, well, we're more efficient. We're making sure that nothing's missed but you're also losing out a lot of the personal communication. I can tell you when I was a young guy, I first went into medicine 30 years ago, I would read the notes and I would always want to look at the attending's note. The attending would write a note, just two sentences, and it would tell you exactly what was going on with the patient. Then the medical student would write a three page note where every checkbox was checked, but it'd be close to worthless. And that's what I think is going to happen with artificial intelligence taking over more medicine because you're trying to put people, you know, round things into square pegs or whatever, you know what I'm saying? That, 
that's not how medicine really is. Like, for example, I think medical education in this country is kind of a joke. And you say, well, why? How could I say that? And I'll tell you why. Because, for example, we learn all this mathematics. I'm a triple boarded high tech doctor. I don't use any math I didn't know already in fourth grade. And they study all this calculus and advanced statistics and all that stuff. You don't use it. And then you study all this physical chemistry, all this physics. It's irrelevant. They don't know anything about nutrition. So probably at least 70% of disease is caused by nutrition and toxicology, but they don't learn any of it. You talk to an average medical student, they can't answer a single question that's relevant to health, okay? But they've memorized all this stuff. They've memorized the 10th symptom of a rare disease, but their ignoramuses, when they talk about diabetes, hypertension, atherosclerosis, obesity, all the common things, autoimmune disease. And so, you know, I don't think real conventional medicine is ever going to change because <clears throat> there's simply no money in teaching low fat vegan diet to people compared to doing things like open heart surgery. So I don't see it changing. Um, I simply sort of see, you know, there was a line in a book by Kiyosaki talking about his father. He said, basically you leave the light on, you know, let's say for a, a kid who's confused, you know, that they'll come back home and they'll see things in a better way. And I think in a sense, that's sort of what we do with this health stuff. We'll tell people about all these healthy things they can do to help themselves. And hopefully they'll seek it out and learn. But you also, you can't push a person up a ladder. They have to want to, to climb up the ladder to help themselves. And not many people are motivated to do that. Not many people are motivated to admit they screwed up in the past and they're willing to change and learn. So you do what you can, but I don't, I think big conventional medicine is always going to be big money medicine because the financial uh, players that control it, the big industry, that's what they want. And they've got the money. Why would they want to change anything? They're making billion dollars a year. They're not going to change anything. Um, so an individual simply has to seek out the learning for themselves. And if they do, they can learn a lot that helps them. That's great. Thanks. Did you ever watch television? Very little. I haven't owned a TV, gosh, in like 40 years. Um, I was never much of a TV watcher. I think TV is a waste of time, an absolute waste of time. And really, I think if you find yourself watching TV, you should question yourself about your life, that you're screwing up and ask yourself, could I use this time more effectively? Uh, when I was younger, I made a, on a piece of paper, I listed every 30 minutes in the day. And I said, how can I get the most out of this time? How can I get the most out of this time? And I, I didn't want to waste a minute. Um, and, and it's sort of like seeing yourself progress in something that you care about, that makes you happy. Um, and it's been joked, you know, when that guy Watson who discovered, you know, the DNA structure along with Crick, he said, an animal is happy when it does what it's designed to do. A horse is happy when it runs. And it's sort of, you know, like I said, too, I sort of feel like I was born to be a scholar. So I'm happy when I'm reading, studying and learning. I mean, don't be wrong. I love having conversations with friends. I love, you know, being around friends and family and joking around. Of course, I love all that. But what I'm saying is, you know, Aristotle had said, Learning and contemplation is the greatest of all pleasures because unlike the others, it does not wax and wane. And that's true. You can enjoy it all day long, day after day versus a lot of other things are transient. You know, I enjoy a meal, but the meal's over in an hour, you know. Yeah, well, Dr. Rogers, it was so fun talking to you. I could talk to you another three hours, but I do have another show with Dr. Will B at noon. So if it's okay, I'll say goodbye to you for today, but I know you'll come back next month. And I, I, I'm guessing it's part two because we call today part one. Yes, I'll talk more about ions and some other toxicology stuff. Yeah, you're, you're, I think you're fascinating. I love you. you I, I mean, do you know who Dr. Alan Goldhammer is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a very bright guy. I know him over two Because you remind me. Of yeah, well, I'd love to introduce you. I, could, is there any chance you'll come to California for a visit? Because he's coming to my house for brunch next month. <laughs> I mean, because you guys remind me of each other. I, I think you're you're quirky, but I think you're wonderful and it's, you're fun to listen to. I'd love to. I'd love for you to meet him. Well, I'd love to chat with him. I pro I'm probably not traveling to California anytime soon. I got to work a lot, but I would love to talk with him. I would love. I would love to. Again, we're having a conference, and he's going to be one of the speakers. And God, you'd be a great speaker at a conference. So yeah, but you you could only you have, you have to limit to an hour though for conferences. Well, invite me. If somebody invites me, I'd be happy to. Nobody invites me anywhere. Well, I'm inviting you, but <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, I'd love to. All right, I'll I'll find a way to do that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in a little bit under an hour for Dr. Will B. He's going to talk about how you can empower your gut. Take care, everybody. And please, if you like what you see, give me a thumbs up now and then. And really, it would help me so much if you subscribe because I'm really close to 200,000.